Good evening, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Leia Harwitz for putting the uh, symposium together. <laughs> We're going to try something a little bit differently, th differently this year. Um, we're going to try an interactive. Um, we're going to try an interactive dementia tour. What's that? My name is Brach Yashuk. My name is Brach Yashuk. We're good? I just work here. I'll give you, I'll give you a rundown in about two minutes, all right? Okay. Um, the name of the uh, company that's going to be doing the uh, virtual tour, it's a company called Right at Home. Um, this company has been around for a long time. They've done this uh, professionally for quite some time as well. They've done this quite a number of years. Um, it's given by Mr. Walter Ochoa, who's done this. Um, we'll find out. He's going to pick out a couple people from the audience that are going to be doing the, the virtual reality part of the uh, program with him. If you're interested in that, I guess when the time comes, raise your hand and he'll be happy to put your line. Walter, the table is yours. Thank you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Aguilar. I'm the marketing and sales director for the company you see on the screen behind me right at home. This evening, for the next 45 minutes, you are going to see the most unique Alzheimer's dementia training available. This training has been brought to thousands of medical professionals across New York City over the last few years. Matter of fact, we've trained staff at this facility just some months ago nurses and social workers and certified nurse assistants asked us to come in and bring this training. Now I should warn you, at the end of the presentation, we're going to ask for two volunteers. What you're going to be doing is we're going to be placing some equipment on you because you're going to actually experience what it's like just for a few minutes to have Alzheimer's. At this moment, I'd like to introduce our instructor, our trainer, and the director right at home, Mr. Walter Ochoa. Hey guys, how are you? I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. And uh, you know, as Tony mentioned, you know, uh, what we do, we provide home care services. We help seniors at home, very simple, right? But this is what happened seven years ago. I started getting calls from my caregivers. My caregivers used to come to my office and they say, Walter, that's it. I'm calling it quits. I don't going back to the client's home. And I, when I say, why? What happened? Well, you know what? She's calling me names. She's been difficult. That's it. I'm not coming back. Now imagine me as a new director of uh, Right at Home several years ago. All of a sudden, my caregivers don't want to come back to my client's homes. And then when I start asking what happened, and we start finding out a little more, it turned out to be that Mrs. Smith had Alzheimer's and all of a sudden it came to me my god people don't understand Alzheimer's my god you know they need to know what's going on because you know what you cannot really possible describe what it's like to have a broken arm until you actually experience a broken arm so I started learning a little more about that and I actually received this training in Atlanta and ever since we've been training our caregivers to experience Alzheimer's in the first place and this is what we're going to be doing tonight. Now, before we even go there, I really want to give you a glimpse of what Alzheimer's is. I know we're going to see it, but also we need to understand what's going on here. Because you know what? The behaviors they have, they have it for a reason. It's not because they want to be difficult. It's not because they are pretending. Something is going on. So let's explore the brain. And then once we explore our brain, we're going to start realizing that the ones who need to change is us. Fair enough? All right. So first of all, let's take some place out of the way. Because I hear a lot of people confusing Alzheimer's with dementia. Everybody understands the difference? 
No. All right. What happened here? Gone? All right. If not, I can scream. Hello? I hear you. So this is the difference. Guys, imagine that I'm, I'm walking in the street, right? And all of a sudden, you see me doing this. Oh. Oh. And I start sweating. And I start breathing heavily. What do you think is happening to me? Heart attack, how do you know? Because you saw me behaving somehow, some way, weird, right? Something is going on with me. So based on my symptoms, you kind of, kind of say, you know what? This guy has a heart attack. You don't really know what's going on. I need to go to the hospital. And then when I'm in the hospital, I say, you know what? He had a stroke or has a, a blockage or an arrhythmia. So you can tell that something is going on in my heart by my symptoms. But the symptoms is not really the heart attack. The heart attack is something physically happening in my heart. Fair enough? But this is no different. Dementia is the symptom. Alzheimer's is the disease. Everybody with me? So what are the symptoms of Alzheimer's? What are the symptoms of dementia? What are the symptoms of dementia? What do you see the people behaving? How do you see the people behaving they, when they have Alzheimer's? Everybody. This is very interactive, guys. Paranoia. What else? Anxiousness. What else? Forgetfulness. There you go. Repetitiveness. Something is going on. Beautiful. So that is dementia. So the next time somebody asks you, or you tell so, somebody, say, you know, my mom has dementia, what is the next question you need to ask? What type of dementia? Now, Alzheimer's is one of them. 60% of people that show symptoms of dementia is because they have Alzheimer's. There's other types of dementia. Lewy body's dementia, va vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's. And dementia can be a long term and dementia can be short term. Oh, that's it. Oh, all right. Dementia can be short term and dementia can be long term. Can somebody tell me a short term dementia? Can everybody hear me? Does everybody hear me? Everybody? No. I don't know. But anyway. All right. So I'm going to keep screaming then. <laughs> so, the, oh, there you go. Dementia can be short term, right? Imagine you take medications, right? So you can also start hallucinating. But once you stop taking those medications, you're okay, fi you're fine, okay ag again, right? So that was a short term dementia. Alzheimer's, unfortunately, is a long term dementia. How long a person with Alzheimer's can live? <laughs> years and years. And guys, that's why I want to stop right here. Because family members think they can take care of people with Alzheimer's. They say, you know what? Who knows better my mom than me? I can take care of mom. But you know what? Guys, is this heavy? It's not heavy, right? You think I can do this? For how long? Ah, can I do it for five seconds? Can I do it for an hour? Uh, what about 24 hours? No, right? Uh, eventually, my hand is going to start falling. This is not different when people say, I'll take care of my mom. Guys, people with Alzheimer's can live 15 years. And believe me, it's a quite a task. You need to ask for help. And I'm going to repeat it again. Guys, if you're taking care of somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's, you need to ask for help. Because sometimes, the people with the disease lives longer than the ones are taken care of. <laughs> and guys, think about this. You have so many resources in New York City. It would be a sin if you don't ask for help. Fair enough? All right, so now that we remove a lot of stuff from going on, now you know what is Alzheimer's, what is dementia. Now the question that I have for you is, so what is Alzheimer's? What's going on in the brain? Do you think the people just pretending again? What do you think is going on? Can somebody tell me what is Alzheimer's? What is that disease? What's going on? Anybody? Something happens in the brain, but what is happening? Well, 
something is going on with the brain, right? Plaques, we talk about plaques, we talk about handling. handling. All right, guys, uh, the other day I was in Caring Kind doing a conference, and I was almost the last to give the conference. And it were researchers, were doctors, were everybody talking about Alzheimer's. By the time I stand up and I say, all right, guys, so everybody's expert on Alzheimer's, right? Everybody should know. Can you please tell me who, what Alzheimer's is? You know how many people raise their hands? Nobody. My goal today is for you guys to understand Alzheimer's. And you're going to say, wow, now I understand Alzheimer's. And for that, we're going to start with something that is called biology. Let's go biology 101. Let's go to the basics. I'm going to be asking you a few questions. Guys, what is a cell? You know what is a cell? Are we made, we're made out of cells, right? How many? Trillions of cells. Trillions and trillions. Now, you know that they have the basic same structure. However, depending where that cell is, depending the function that it's going to be doing. So let's say that I take a little cell from my heart, right? And I put it under the microscope. In a nutshell, what do you think that cell is doing? If you see it under the microscope and assume that it's alive, what do you think it's doing? You know what it's doing? Multiplying, yeah, they multiply, but the, the function that it does is this. Look, it's actually beating. Now, what happens when millions and millions of them do this at the same time? Because the brain is telling, now you do it. Now you do it. Now you do it. What do you think is going to happen? What is the end result? Is the heart beating. How beautiful is that, right? Now, we also have cells in our kidneys, right? Let's say that I take that cell from my kidney and I see it under the microscope. What do you think, in a nutshell, that cell is going to be doing? What about filtering the blood? Little, but when we're all together, filter. They say toxins here, normal blood here. What do you do with the toxins? You go to the bathroom. Well, the same way we have cells in our brain. Those cells are so wonderful that are, they, they actually have a name. What is the name of those cells that we have in our brain? Neurons, right? How many neurons we have in our brain? Billions. Around 100 billion neurons in the brain. What do you think, in a nutshell, is the function of the neuron? Anybody? Send messages, but even more. What is the basic function of the neuron? I would argue that one of the basic functions of the neuron is creating memories. You create memories. The memories that you are not aware of, you know, like a, the heartbeat is a memory, but it's controlled by an autonomous system. You know, but also we create memories. What are the first memories that we create as soon as we are born, when the baby is out? What is the, doc what the doctor does? Hit the baby so the baby starts breathing, right? So that's a memory, but you don't have to remember it. Every three seconds I hit to breathe, but somehow it's a memory. Then you keep growing. You create creating more memories. What next do you do after you're born and you start crying? What the doctor do give you, the, the nurse? A bottle or, 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 or milk from the mom, right? It keeps, we keep learning. Then we know how to recognize mom's face. Then we know how to walk. Then we know how to read. Then we know how to write. Then we keep growing and we keep getting all this information. And every time you do that, you create a memory. How the brain creates memories? Well, very simple. Remember the neurons that I was telling you about, the, the cells in our heads? Let's assume that the neuron looks a little bit like my hand. Actually, it looks a little bit. You know, it has the dendrites, you know, the body and the axon. Remember, we have 100 billion of them in our brain, right? Now, how do you create a memory? You repeat things, right? Repeat things, or you associate it with something. Let's make an experiment here. Do you guys remember the name of our agency? Right at, right at home, right? So if you really want to put it in your brain, what you have to do is this. You need to repeat it, right? Right at home, right at home, right at home. Or you associate it with something. I feel right at home. This is what is happening when you create those memories, guys. These two neurons start talking to each other right at home, right at home, right at home. 
right at home, right at home. Eventually, you create that connection. And when you create that connection, what you do is actually, what is the name of this connection, guys? It's called synapses. When you create a connection, you create a memory. Now, why is it important for us to know how we create memories? Because Alzheimer's somehow, some way, is losing all those beautiful memories that we have, right? So somebody mentioned around here plaques and tangos, right? Plaques. Do we hear about a lot of the plaques, the main culprits of uh, Alzheimer's? What is a plaque? Plaque is actually a, it's a protein. It's, a, it's a, like a substance, gooey substance. So imagine that this is the plaque, right? And imagine that the, you cannot get rid of the plaque somehow, some way in your brain. Your brain cannot get rid of this plaque. And these plaques start accumulating in your brain. And every time you have more and more, this plaque actually gets in the middle of the beautiful connections of the neurons. What do you think is going to happen here? Will they be able to talk to each other? No, right? You know what is going to happen? These guys are going to try to get rid of this plaque. You say, you know what? Get, this is not normal. You know what is going to happen in the process? They're going to destroy themselves. And what happens when you start destroying neurons? What else do you destroy? Memories. Memories. And that's Alzheimer's, guys. You understand it now? Why is it important to know that? Because if you know what's happening in the brain, all of a sudden you understand their behaviors. And when you understand their behaviors, you are the one who say, you know what, I need to change. Because they can no longer change. Something is going on. So this is the plaques and tangles. You know, these are the, the neurons. Now, look at the brain. Look what happened in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Look at the blue shade. That is the plaque piling up in the brain. Look what happened in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. You see it in one spot, right? Look what happened when you have moderate Alzheimer's disease. It's expanding, right? Look what happened when you have severe Alzheimer's disease. It's throughout the brain. And every time it's expanding on those little places, it's destroying those places in the brain. Now, different parts of the brain do different activities, right? So if you know that those activities are no longer done normal because the brain is getting destroyed, all of a sudden you see the reasons why people behave like that. How are we doing on time? All right, excellent. Because then I, I really want to, you guys want to know more about the brain? Excellent. So let's go there. So the disease is going to start affecting different parts of the brain. Everybody gets that, right? And in every part that is going to be affected is going to start destroying neurons, right? And every time that the normal function is not done, you're going to have different behaviors. Everybody with me, right? All right, cool. So let's see what happens when it attacks the hypo hippocampus. The hippocampus controls the conversion of short-term memories into long-term memory. What is a short-term memory? What were you doing an hour ago? What were you doing an hour ago? You were coming, you were walking, and you came here. So if I ask you, did you walk to the presentation? You're going to tell me, you remember an hour ago? I say, yeah, I was walking. Is that a short-term memory or is it a long-term memory? Short-term short memory. is the working memory, right? Is the one that you used to say, you know what? Let me, let me remember this number, 347 Then while you write it, and then after that you forget. The short-term memory, working memory, right? What were you doing 20 years ago? <laughs> you don't know. Give me, a, give me a big idea what were you doing 20 years ago. He was working. Where? All right. Photography, right? So if I ask you, did you ever work as a photographer, what are you going to tell me? Yes. yes. So he remembers what happened 20 years ago. Now, what can you expect as a behavior when the Short-term memory can no longer convert into long-term memory. Would you remember what happened five minutes ago? But you're going to remember what happened 20 years ago, right? Because that part of the, the, the memory is not destroyed. Have you guys seen that behavior? Have you seen the behavior that you just feed somebody, and then that person's going to be 
I didn't have anything to eat. And you're going to say, yes, you did. And they're going to say, no, I didn't. You're going to say, yes, you did. They're going to know you did it. And then you're going to start having this fight, no sensing fight. You shouldn't be fighting. You should be know that the person can no longer remember what happened five minutes ago. And therefore, who needs to change? We need to change. And when we change, we say, you know what, dear, don't worry about it. I'll get you a little something. Instead of fighting, you dance with them. Fair enough? You still gonna remember what happened 20 years ago. So probably she's gonna tell you what happened 20 years ago, but she doesn't remember what happened five minutes ago. And this is a very emotional impact to a lot of families. Walter, I cannot believe this. My mom doesn't remember my face. There you go. They remember the face of the kid 20 years ago, but not the face of the kid now. And they think that mom forgot about me. No, she forgot the face of you now, but she is always going to have you in your heart. So you need to put things in perspective. And once you start understanding the brain, you start understanding their behavior. And you need to change. Temporary love. I'm sorry? The flag, you know, it, it could be genetic. It could be environment reasons, you know. Uh, why I have high cholesterol higher than the, uh, and my cholesterol. Look at me. I'm not even fat, you know. And my cholesterol is very high. It's my metabolism. Somehow it's doing, you know. So how, how can I con control it? Well, maybe I can just do more exercise, eat better than the rest of the population. My wife eats everything. The cholesterol is so low. I'm so envious, envious about it, you know, but we don't know. So temporal love, understanding language. Guys, the person with Alzheimer's will not understand language the way that we understand. Everybody understands English here, right? Because your temporal love is understanding it. What can you expect when that part of the brain is no longer working properly? Will you understand what I'm saying? No. Let's make a quick experiment here. Who in this room speaks Spanish? Oh, sir, oh my God, you know, I, I wasn't expecting seeing this. <laughs> all right, let's make a quick experiment, all right? For the ones who understand Spanish, just pretend that you don't. <laughs> For everybody else, let's pretend that you do. So I'm going to be telling you, I'm going to be asking you to do something in Spanish, and I'm going to expect you to do it, but you don't know Spanish. So let's see how this goes, all right? Bueno, buenos días, buenas noches. En este momento, quiero que todos en este cuarto se levanten y se vayan. Bueno, en este momento, quiero que todos en este cuarto se levanten y se vayan. Bueno, ¿qué está pasando acá? Les estoy diciendo que se levanten y se vayan. Okay, let me stop it right. So what happened here, guys? I'm assuming that you know Spanish because you've been speaking Spanish forever. But you really don't because your temporal love is no longer working. So you don't really understand that, right? But what else you pick from me? Body language. Was I upset? What, what? And you saw me. Do you think this is going to help on our relationship? Absolutely not. You guys going to hate me if I have this behavior. Now, what can I do now understanding that my temporal love is not working properly? What can I do, me, the caregiver, to make sure that we have a nice conversation. Maybe body language, right? Maybe you know that body language is 80% of what we say is body language, 20% is what we say. All right, so let's do it. In this moment, I'm going to be asking you to do something, and I'm going to be asking you to do something in Spanish, but I'm going to use body language this time, all right? Let's see if you guys understand. In este momento, quiero que... Todos ustedes se levanten. <laughs> y quiero que se vayan del cuarto. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody understands Spanish, right? Yeah. Why? Because body language makes the difference, guys. And we, when we're taking care of people with Alzheimer's, we need to understand that body language is important. Mrs. Smith, I'm going to give you a shower. Would you like to help me taking your shirt off? 
Now imagine if instead of doing that, I'm just coming to that person and I say, all right, come. I need to take your, what do you think is happening here? He, he doesn't want me near him. And he's with all, I mean, I understand nobody wants anybody near to anybody. So I need to change. I need to use a different body language. Hey, you know, would you like to have a shower? Yes. yes. Would you want to help me taking your shirt off? All right, come. Look at this. Hand on their hand. Who is doing it? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who is doing it? I'm doing it, but who thinks he's doing it? Did I make a difference? Who changed, guys? We need to change. How long I have? I need to keep. All right, let's brush it. Frontal love. Guys, the frontal love is going to be, you know, affecting the logical thought, solving problems, impu impulse control. What can you expect if the frontal love is no longer working properly? What is the process for you to put your shoes on? Your shoes on. <laughs> How do you put your shoes on? Just tell me the process. You start with the shoe, right? What do you do next? Put your foot in. What do you do next? You tie it. That's it. That's the process, right? That is a logical process. What can you expect from a person who can no longer magic logic? Will be they be able how to know how to put your shoes on? Absolutely not. That's why we need caregivers to dress them. Wait a second. Is the shoe first or the socks first? It's a valid question. If you don't have the logical power, all of a sudden you're going to start struggling. Solving problems. What happens if you, how do you pay your rent? What is the process of you paying your rent? Tell my wife to write a check. Okay, you tell your wife to write a check. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the money, right? All right. <laughs> what else? Put it in the mail and you send it. What can you expect if you lose the checkbook? What do you do? You have to go to the bank. And then you need to get a, 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 another checkbook and cancel the previous one. You don't want to get compromised. What are you doing there? You are solving problems. What happens if you can no longer solve problems? Will you be able to pay your rent? Are you going to get evicted? Probably. So guys, we need to be thoughtful about they can no longer solve the problems the way we did. Impulse control, the ability to control all impulses. Remember how I started this conversation? My caregivers come in and say, you know what, Walter, I don't want to come back. She's calling me names. She's being difficult. She can no longer control herself. But you know why? It's because the frontal love is not working properly. Are they to blame? Who needs to change? We need to change. We need to be the ones who say, you know what? I understand where you're coming through, and you are the one who needs to be the big person. If the person is abusive, if the person is difficult, you, unfortunately, guys, you are the, need, the one who needs to withstand all that stuff. And if you can no longer do it, ask for help. Please. The disease is going to keep spreading, and it's going to be affecting everything, guys. The way you see, the way you smell, the way you touch, everything, the way you smell. Perception is reality. But when you no longer have the perception, the ability to understand your entire environment, your reality is going to be torn apart. You guys want to see a brain with Alzheimer's? Look at the one on the left. The one on the left is a brain with Alzheimer's. Do you see what happened with the size? By the time of death, a brain with Alzheimer's is one-third smaller than a normal brain. Medi doctors take it out. They dissect it. Family wants to know if my mom or dad died from Alzheimer's. Look what they found when they dissected. Guys, what is this thing here? It's a hole. People with Alzheimer's have holes in the brain. Who is the one who needs to change? We need to change. Now you guys have a really good understanding of Alzheimer's, right? 
Now we're going to make you feel what it's like to have Alzheimer's. So for that, we're going to be asking for two volunteers. And uh, we're going to be putting some equipment on you. And you guys want to experience firsthand? You want to do it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So you have to share here? Yeah. Just for a little bit. All right. Excellent. So and, and I need another person. You want to do it? All right. So come over then. All right. So if you don't mind sitting here, and what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be putting some equipment, and I'm going to be telling you the reasons why we're putting the equipment on, you know? And little by little, we're going to be transforming you as a person with Alzheimer's, all right? Uh, who else is coming? There you go. Beautiful. All right. So the first thing we're going to be doing, and this is all sterilized, guys. Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, how easy or difficult would it be for you to put these inserts inside your shoes? You guys cannot see it? Uh, you know what? All right. You guys want to move a little bit here? Let's move a little bit. Right, let's try to, let's have one here and one there, all right? So put it inside. There is a very soft side and there is a pointy side. You're going to be wearing the pointy side. Guys, what is the typical age of a person with Alzheimer's? Is it in their 20s? Is it in their 30s? 40s? No, probably it's in the 70s, right? So people with Alzheimer's, they already have physical impairments. So what we're going to try to do is give you lack of circulation, neuropathy, pain. That's why we're putting these inserts inside your shoes. The next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting, I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I <laughs> she will stand up eventually. We, we just need to put the equipment on for a little bit. The next thing we're going to be doing, we're going to be asking you to wear gloves. Why is important? Because the nerves in the hands are no longer the way that it used to be. You don't feel the same way. Give me the, the gloves, Don. And guys, what is the biggest organ in the body? It's the skin. Whatever you feel in your hand is going to feel throughout the body. Why is it important for us to know that people with Alzheimer's will not feel the same way? Because they can get burned, and they will not feel it, but they will get hurt. You are giving them a shower, and then all of a sudden they change the water, and what is going to happen? They're going to start hitting the back, and what is going to happen with the back? It's going to get burned, but they will not feel it. You allow them to cook. They cook it, and all of a sudden they put their hand in the stove stop, the top. What is going to happen? They're going to get burned. So we have to be thoughtful about that. So you're going to start feeling a little less. The next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting you these glasses. Guys, as we age, our peripheral vision is start getting narrower and narrower and narrower. But what is peripheral vision? It's what you see when I'm coming on the side. People with Alzheimer's that typically are older can no longer see when you are approaching them from the side. Tony, can you please come for a second? You see me coming, right? I want you to use your peripheral vision. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. You stand here, please. You see me coming, right? Yes, I see you. What do you think that happens when you no longer have peripheral vision? Do this for me, please. Will you see me coming? Hey! <laughs> what happened? You need to approach the people, not just the people with Alzheimer's, but also seniors from the front, never from the back, never from the sides, because they don't longer see you. So we're going to be doing that. Also, people with uh, elderly people, normally their vision actually turns a little bit yellowish as we age because the glasses in the eyes are actually getting thicker and thicker. So our perception of color is going to be different. Why is it important for us to know that? Mom, take one pill in the morning, the yellow one, and take one pill in the, in the afternoon, the white one. We'll be, be able to understand the difference in colors. No. Guys, it's all about putting ourselves in their shoes, right? So this is going to be very simple. Put this on, please. We're going to be asking also to put these headsets. Headsets, this is just for people who doesn't hear right. But also, people with Alzheimer's will lose the ability to know where the sounds are coming from. I want everybody to close your eyes right now. Everybody close your eyes. And I want you to point where my voice is. Point where my voice is. Point where my voice is. Keep pointing. Keep pointing, 
Keep pointing, keep pointing, keep pointing, keep pointing. Okay, open your eyes. How you guys do that? Everybody was pointing at me because you have two ears. One ear is hearing a little louder than the other one. The other one is hearing faster and the, the sound as the other one. Therefore, you know what's going on. People with Alzheimer's can no longer do that. We might have a conversation here, and they might think that the conversation is in another room. Or somebody else might have a conversation in the other room. They think it's here. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to be doing this simulation. So this is going to be very simple. I'm going to give you the instructions. During the next few minutes, we will attempt to give you a sense of what Alzheimer's is all about. Obviously, your sensory abilities will be alter altered. Please do not remove the equipment until I tell you to do so. I will ask you to perform five tasks for me, five tasks. People is going to be observing you all the time. Please immerse yourself in your feelings. Fair enough? Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm, I'm going to ask her to, to stand up right now, OK? You ready? Yeah. All right, cool. Let me put this on. Would you mind raising your hair a little bit so I can put yeah. it on, on top of your, yeah. just put it on. Uh, on, your, on your ears, in, in your ears. Like this? Like this. All right. I, I can't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching her. All right. Can you please do me a favor? Can you please match? You've got to tie her shoelaces. Tie her. I'm going to start with her. Then. Tie, tie her shoes. Oh, you could? All right, cool. All right. It's on, right? Yeah. All right. Can you please do me a favor? <laughs> can you please just find the blue sweater, put it on, write three sentences to your family, drink the water, and uh, match the socks. Thank you. <laughs> what did I do wrong, guys? Everything, right? <laughs> did I try my best to communicate? Can you please find the blue sweater for me? Find the necktie and put it on. Write three sentences to your family. And, uh, you know, fold the towel. Thank you. <laughs> guys, do you think it's fair if I start doing this after this? No, right? <laughs> Texting, taking pictures. <laughs> what happens if I don't change? What is going to happen? What is going to be the result? <laughs> they can actually get in trouble. Remember they have the memory of 20 years ago? They will remember that they need to go to work. They're going to stand up and say, I need to go to work. If nobody's watching them and nobody's taking care of them, they're going to get in trouble. And right now, have you seen this behavior before? It's not helping anybody, right? Do you think that they're going to be able to perform their activities of daily living, taking showers, dressing? They actually hear noises. We need to keep a very, very quiet environment. If we just make too many noises, they're going to start getting agitated. They're going to start getting upset about this. Do you think they could develop some kind of stress disorder, maybe you know, getting depression? Absolutely. I, I, I mentioned because she's from Ocala and she's doing depression. <laughs> it's not fair, guys. Now, sometimes family you members. Do also, you can make sense. Exactly. <laughs> sometimes. So what so, saying, so but it's not making any sense. Any sense. Sometimes families say, you know what, mom, let me write it for you. You guys see this? It's not even make sense. Let's see. Hey, this is for you. This is instruction. It's a film? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> guys, you see, they are not able to perform any tasks. You guys got the idea? Who needs to change, guys? We are the ones who need to go above and beyond and make sure that we take care of them. Because if not, this is going to be the result. I'm going to take them back. I'm going to sit them. And we're going to take away uh, the, the headsets, and I want everybody to clap, all right? Ready? All right, cool. Can I sit down? <laughs> all right, everybody clap. Tony, one, two, three. All right. Tony, take it off. All right. Clap again. <laughs> all right, guys. What happened? I gave you instructions. I asked you to do something. Can you please share with everybody? You, I don't know if you want to take the microphone. Uh, the microphone is not here. You might stand up and tell them what happened. I heard you say something about the tie and about folding the towels and the rest. I don't know. 
So you didn't notice that everything was there, right? She doesn't sing here. No. All right. Sorry, guys. No, I didn't say anything that was there. So you didn't hear it? I heard, no. I just heard you say full of towels and something about a toy. How do you feel when I was just let you, told you instructions and I gave you my back and I didn't follow up with you? How do you feel as a person? Very bad. Very bad. What about your level of stress? Do you, heal, do you really hear all those, si those noises? Yes. Alzheimer's people hear all that interference? Absolutely. Absolutely. If it, the environment is very noisy and you have telephone uh, ringing and you, you have a TV on and you have radio on and you have all the kids screaming at each other and everybody screaming at each other, believe me, it's going to be very confusing. If the room is quiet, they will Oh, if the that. room is quiet, it's different. Right. So we, we might have to start thinking about how to improve care with people and keeping as quiet as possible. I'm not saying stay quiet, don't put any music. But that's but, why they but, can't handle stress. There you go. All right, what about you? What do you feel? I felt that I understood everything, but it was your problem. Right. Because I didn't understand you when you want me to do something. It's not Absolutely. my problem, it's your problem. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, guys, unfortunately, we don't have more time. I really would like to go a little more into what can we do to change that. But we don't have time, you know. But what we can do is that we're going to be leaving you a list of things, top 10 BDT right at home ways to improve care of people with Alzheimer's. I hope you guys learned something today, and thank you so much, all right? All right. All right. I understand. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, yeah. Walter, thank you very much. That was really, really informative. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to have each vendor just for literally 100 seconds apiece tell us a little bit wha about what they do, um, how they can help us to solve some of the issues that we're having. Um, and after that, we're going to have the uh, pre the uh, and after that, we're going to have um, our guest speaker Gary um, give us his presentation. Gary, go. Hi, my name is Tzvi Grauman. I work with Elite Home Care. We are a licensed home care agency that provides home care attendance as well as the CDPAP services, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. A number of you over in the past years have spoken with us about services or just to understand more about what we do. Um, one of the things that has always come out that we're a little bit different than maybe some of the others, we send someone to your home. A from woman co will come out. She will spend some time with you. She'll try to better understand what it is that you're looking for, what type of service you're looking for. Home attendants, as many of you probably know, are not always exactly what you're looking for. You might be looking to have someone from your family, a friend, a neighbor, somebody who might be willing to come and stay with your loved one, and she can help if that's the right decision for you. And even if a home attendant is the right decision for you, she can help guide you, help find the right person. She'll come back to our office, speak to the people in the office who are helping to, to make that, that shit up, basically, and she'll tell them, this family needs this type of person. She'll go to the home with the home attendant, and she will be able to help explain to them what kashris is specific to what your needs are as opposed to a general rule of what kashris is because everyone has a different understanding. This is, it is basically for Medicaid clients, but if anyone has a, per if they're paying privately or long-term care insurance, all those things are, are accepted as well. Um, if anyone's interested in more information, we're sitting out here. We have cards, we have information we can give you. A number of you have either used us in the past or continue to use us now. So if there's any questions, we're outside later. Hi. Good evening. My name is Yisrael Brody. I'm a physical therapist. My company is Homeside Rehab. We provide physical, occupational, and speech and swallowing therapy for patients at home. As everybody knows, uh, home is now uh, sort of the best place for elderly people who, are, um, who have dementia. A hospital, for sure is uh, disorienting for any patient, especially for somebody with dementia. And so our goal is to help patients to remain at home and to try to avoid these hospitalizations. Anybody who is able to go to an outpatient therapy office, 
should really be going to an outpatient therapy office. But the ones that cannot, Medicare Part B will still pay for many visits of therapy at home. And for more information, you can see us in the back. Some members of our team are here with us. Um, we also can, uh, can help you and guide you in many other resources that you can receive at home. And so reaching out to us uh, for any kind of services for an elderly person at home will be beneficial to you and your family. And for any other information, please see us in the back. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Korsinski. I'm an attorney at Korsinski & Klein. Uh, our firm is uh, an elder law firm. Uh, we deal with uh, various elder law issues. Uh, we do advanced planning. If uh, In preparation, as you heard, people's condition can get worse, um, and they can be in a position where they will need services. As you, as you know, there are vendors outside who deal with uh, you know, me uh, to getting Medicaid. Uh, we do that. We do. Our goal is to do uh, advanced planning whenever possible uh, to deal with um, people's assets. So we'll deal with wills, trusts, estates, power of attorney, healthcare proxies. It basically, elder law planning. So when someone p typically, you, you can never predict when people's conditions will get worse uh, or if something happens. Uh, but we typically, uh, you know, historically people at around. 60 years old and older uh, start to think about what to do with their finances. And uh, it's not an easy topic um, to deal with these issues, but uh, our firm handles this. This is what we specialize in, um, in addition to real estate and other matters. And we also deal with uh, more crisis planning when people did not do the planning in advance, where they did not have advanced planning, power of attorney, healthcare proxies, uh, or trusts. And then they're stuck with dealing with the uh, possibility of going to a nursing home or needing aids uh, to help for a loved one, they will, uh, will we, we can deal with that. Um, and if we have to, we can deal with doing guardianships um, and other advanced uh, planning. So that's what we do. If you have any other questions uh, as to what kind of services we provide or what we can do for you, we're available outside. We have uh, three attorneys here today. Thank you. Thank you make it really brief. <coughs> My name is Laser Fisher from Accessible Homes. We do home modifications um, such as tub conversions to showers, steel lifts, bathroom, uh, any type of mod modifications like grab bars and even minor stuff, ramps. Um, we do work with many different organizations that pay for these stuff uh, such as MLTCs, that, that officially pay for environmental modifications. And we also deal with many other private organizations that uh, like to fund uh, home modifications for elderly, for seniors, and for the, and for the handicap. Um, we are located outside over here. If you have any questions, accessible homes. So we do uh, free assessments and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the keynote speaker for this tonight's event, um, Gary Joseph LeBlanc. Uh, Gary's been doing this for a very long time. Uh, he's a noted lecturer. Uh, he's based out of North Carolina. He's spo probably spoken last year. Florida. Florida, I'm sorry. Even better. He's probably spoken last year, I'd say probably uh, uh, 365 days in a year. He probably spoke 150 of them. Um, so it's really an honor to have him. He's a noted author, by the way. He'll give you the list of books he's published. They're, on, they're online. You probably can get um, see the books he's published online as well. Um, and without further ado, here's Gary. <laughs> you have your own mic, right? How's that? You got it? All right. All right. Let me find a place to put this up. All right. Um, just a little bit about me before we get going. Um, my name's Gary Joseph LeBlanc. In my family, I just finished a 20-year run last year. I took care of my dad 12 years with Alzheimer's disease. I was his primary and only caregiver. Uh, right after my dad passed, here came mom. 
Uh, she died last March from vascular dementia. So the guy that spoke before me, he covered a lot on the dementia and on Alzheimer's. But I want to cover about some of the other diseases shortly on it, because it's not just Alzheimer's. There's other stuff happening out there on it. So I want to make sure we get clear on this on it. And I just had a conversation with one lady here earlier about a Lewy body dementia. So we're going to cover different dementias on this, on it. All right, let's get this going here. All right. So he mentioned the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. The only thing I want to add to that is a professor from Boston University that wrote a great paper on this. And to paraphrase what he was saying, he goes, you've got to consider the word Alzheimer's, dementia, like the word flu. If you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you got the flu, he's only telling you you have flu-like symptoms. You can't hear? How's that? A little bit better? I can speak louder. All right. Okay, so the... The point we're saying, dementia is an umbrella term for multiple symptoms. So when you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you get the flu, all he is telling you is you have flu-like symptoms. What he's not telling you is what virus has come and invaded your body to give you the symptoms of the flu. And honestly, this is how we have to start looking at this to diagnose these people correctly. How many people we know that are in their 90s that are very sharp? This is how life is supposed to be. All right, 90, that's good. But if you've got cognitive issues happening in your body, you've got dementia coming in, there is something in your body causing it. And that's what we have to look at, is what's causing it. We can't just keep calling everything Alzheimer's. Because there's way more to go about all this, and we're going to cover this a little bit on it. So it's the symptoms of dementia, the cognitive impairment, the difficult communications, right, complex tasks, finishing planning and organization, motor skills. Right? People with dementia will start getting a gait walk, a shuffle in the later stages on this. This is the motor function is actually dissolving as they go through this on it. Problems with disorientation, such as getting lost, and poor decision making. I was taught early on in <laughs> Journalism 101, do not underline. I've been writing a weekly column for about 10 years. It'll be 10 years in August. I've written about 400 articles in newsprint throughout the country on it. I was taught early, you do not underline. You won't find anything underlined in a newsprint. I forced myself to underline this because we're all making bad decisions. I was making bad decisions. The doctors are making bad decisions. The family members are making bad decisions. And the people living with dementia are making bad decisions. So the more we learn tonight, this is our goal. We've got to stop making bad decisions and make better decisions for these people and for the caregivers as we go through this stuff on it. Right? And other causes of dementia, not just Alzheimer's, not just disease or orientated. How many people do we know that has a urine tract infection and all of a sudden their confusion goes from here to there? Right? So this is the infection coming in and giving the people the symptoms of dementia, not even disease related. Metabolic problems. If your thyroid is off, it's, you're gonna, I was teaching a class like this in Minnesota and I got a woman saying, she goes, that's why when my Synthoid medications is off, I feel like I have Alzheimer's? She goes, that's exactly what's happening to you. So again, this is a metabolic problem going through your system. All right? Nutritional deficiency, dehydration. How many people do we know that end up in the emergency room dehydrated, all confused? My mother, at the end, I was like, the only time I could get some fluids into her was pill time. One more sip, please, Mom. One more sip with the pills. I mean, so we started, what did you do? Lunchtime, we started making soups. We started doing jellos. We used stuff like that that's going to bring in some dehydration for them on it. Right? And the vitamin B. B1, B6, B12 is extremely important for our cognitive health. And here's the problem today. You go to the doctor and you go, doctor, every time I walk in here, I put something down, I can't find it. I'm losing dates. I'm losing faces. And doctor, right? The first thing this man should be doing is doing some blood work on you to see if you're not B12 deficient. But instead, in a lot of cases, you're getting a diagnosis PD, probably Alzheimer's disease. And as I talk a little bit further, you'll see how much important that vitamin B is. People that truly worry me are people that are vegan. If you're truly vegan, You've literally taken all your vitamin B out of your diet. I'm not going to tell you not to be vegan, but please be on a supplement, a vitamin B supplement to keep that nutrition coming into you on it. Because we all start losing vitamin B as we get older. Very important we keep this in mind on this. And then the reaction to meds. They end up in the hospital. They go to rehab. By the time they get back home, they're taking new meds from over there, and now they're back home taking the same meds that they were taking before. Yep. I'll try. <laughs> All right, we won't cover this because it's a covered on, actually I will cover this. What do you think is the biggest mistake caregivers make when you're caring for somebody with dementia? Somebody's got an answer. 
All right. There's no wrong answer, so don't worry about this. Anybody else? Fighting with them? What about over here? Talk to them as if they're normal like you are. All right. You know what my, my opinion? The biggest mistake is not asking for help. With my family, my dad, my family, my responsibility, I got this. Man, was I wrong. By the time I realized how much help and how much trouble I was in, I couldn't even take a breath. So if you're not going to a support group, there must be a support group around here somewhere for you guys. Is there, I think Zach runs, I think Liam does the support groups, right? This is where you're going to learn all the information locally, what's available to you. The very, 20 years ago, I went to my very first support group. It was only one a month in the whole town where I lived. If you missed that one, you had to wait a whole other month, right? First meeting I ever go to, there's two people sitting across from me. Their loved ones had been gone, deceased, for two, three years, but they're still going to the meetings. They had all the information I was looking for, and locally. So this is an important step for you guys on it, all right? And early onset dementia. I want you to understand that right now, 55 is our new magic number for dementia, all right? It's not all Alzheimer's. Some of it is. You get early onset Alzheimer's, but the numbers, in, we got a big group of baby boomers moving forward. Right, so the number of people are higher in that age limit, but it's the different types of dementia that are kicking in. And I, can't, I, get a, I formed an organization called Dementia Mentors four years ago, only for people living with dementia. Right now we've got 130 members from all over the world. We only have six people over the age of 65 on it. We'll get to that in the very end, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. No, different dementia-related diseases. It's not all Alzheimer's. So we're going to cover this real quick, and then we'll get on to caring for these people on it, right? It's different dementia related diseases, Alzheimer's disease, we already got it covered tonight, right? But the Lewy body dementia, front temporal lobe dementia, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, and traumatic brain injury. We have to bring the traumatic brain injury into this category. These kids, and I call them kids that are coming home from Afghanistan, Iraq, our soldiers, 65% of them are coming home with traumatic brain injury. It's the number one injury, right? You can be a 10 year old little girl and get in a severe car accident, and if you live to 70, that could be 60 years of living with cognitive issues. Look at these NFL players. Multiple concussions throughout their careers, they're not getting better. They're full of dementia, all coming on from their injuries. But the problem is sometimes you can't see the physical injury. And you end up in an emergency room, and they're not reckoning that you have dementia from your traumatic brain injury. Sometimes you'll see the scarring, and they get a bad injury that they had. These guys coming home, they're blown up in war, you see this stuff. Do you remember in the old war we used to call this shell shock? You didn't even have to be in the explosion. You just had to be close enough to the, to the compression to rattle your brain and you were damaged. This is something we have to be aware of on it as we go through on it. Now, Lewy body dementia. Who here knows what Lewy bodies is? Right. Robin Williams. Remember Robin Williams, the comedian, the actor? He died a couple of years ago. He ended up killing himself. He hung himself. On it. The man was already diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. All right. Here's the thing. All the money in the world, all the fame, wrong doctors. Turned out they did an autopsy on the brain, man, this man, they did an autopsy on his brain, and they found this man was suffering from Lewy bodies. The Parkinson's should have been the tie-in. Lewy bodies are protein deposits that develop in the nerve cell regions of the brain. They're protein deposits. That's what Lewy bodies are, discovered by Dr. Lewy that are protein deposits that develop in the nerve cell regions of the brain. This is a tough disease right here. It, huh? How can you see only after they've done it? 100% for sure about autopsy on it. But we, now we know the symptoms to look for. And there's a lot of difference in the symptoms on this. And we're going to get to that right now as we go through this on it. All right? This is the second most common type of progression, progressive type of dementia. What do I mean? Faster moving. That five, seven year mark is an average for lifespan for Lewy bodies. I personally know people living that 10, 11 year mark, but they're really close to their end at that point. They've done extremely well. The visual hallucinations with Lewy bodies are severe. 30 years ago, we were calling this little people's disease because that's what they see. They see little kids running around their house. They're seeing children. This, I was doing a speaking event in Wisconsin. I got a friend of mine from Dementia Mentors with Lewy bodies, 52 years old. I said, Craig, come talk to the crowd for me. He stands up, he goes, have you ever seen the movie Chucky? with that little crazy doll, because that's what I see running around my house. On it. But here's the thing. My dad with Alzheimer's was hallucinating daily in the end. But with Lewy bodies, it starts like year two. 
It comes on extremely early. So most of these people are diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. So we all of a sudden see how bad the hallucinations are. And they go, okay, back off. This is probably not Alzheimer's. This is a big difference with this army. This disease is common in the 50. And here's the problem with Lewy bodies. The antipsychotic medications that I, we were giving my dad for his hallucinations completely backfires with Lewy bodies. And they're going to start hallucinating a thousand times worse. So what's happening? In Florida, we have what we call a Baker Act. It's a psych, mandatory psych evaluation, right? The police come, they Baker Act this person. They don't even understand they have Lewy bodies. They send them into behavior health. What do you think behavior health does to this person? They medicate them with all the wrong medications, and they can never get out of the behavior health system on it. So we've got to be careful with this disease. We're getting better at this one, but we've got to be careful with this. I want everybody here to understand the difference between a delusion and a hallucination. Why? Because of medication. If you go to the doctor and say, my wife is hallucinating and she's only delusional, what is that doctor going to do? He's going to over-medicate her. A delusion is a misbelief. When you hear, hey, somebody stole my stuff, you're carrying with somebody with dementia, you're going to hear that. It's coming no matter sooner or later, right? But when you hear somebody say, I just saw this man come in my room, take my wallet and run down the hall, you need to go get him? We're in a whole different ballgame here. The hallucinations are as real as we're, the ground we're standing on. They taste them, they smell them. Yes? It's a, it's a misbelief. They're not seeing the stuff, they're just, their suspiciousness is kicking in, they're thinking it's happening on it. But when they're actually seeing it, this is a different situation as we go through this on it. So we've got to be careful we get these things right on this. Not all hallucinations are visual. Would Louis? That's the best thing you can do at that point. You want to argue with them, it's going to get worse. Right, we're going to get to all this as we go. I just want to brief through this on it, but we're going to get there on this on it. That's one of the problems that they get these diagnoses on it, the psychotic diagnosis on it when it's actually Lewy bodies. It's a cognitive issue. It's not a psychological order. Now let me finish this one real quick on this on it. So it's one of the one that's very common with Lewy bodies is to smell burning electricity, that burning arc, that smoke in a house. So now you get somebody with Lewy bodies, they're running around turning knobs because they think something is burning. They're not turning stuff off, now they're turning everything on. On it. Right? Very, very situa bad situation on this. This is what I want you all to know. You can take an open can of coffee grounds, have them breathe it in, and that's going to clean their sinus palate. In perfume factories, we're using open coffee grounds so they can test different aromas. This is working for Lewy bodies and other dementias. You got coffee in your house? If you don't, I'm not coming. <laughs> I mean, that's as I live on that stuff, man, Dylan. Bottom line, right there. Right? So you, let's tip it on. They say the fresher the grounds, the better it's going to work for them on it. All right. All right. Something I want you to keep in mind too, please. If you're caring for somebody with dementia and they got a hearing aid, or they get, you know, they're wearing glasses, right? What do you think happens when the batteries are dying in that hearing aid and we're not paying attention? Audio hallucinations. They're talking about me over there. You know, all this stuff's going through their mind. I'm in nursing homes all the time. I train facilities all over the country. I can't tell you how many times. There goes this woman down the hall wearing this woman's glasses. This is happening a lot, man. I'm, I promise you this on it. Now, she's got the wrong script. This woman has either no glasses or wearing the other one's glasses, and now they're starting to see things. So these are things that we can help maintain to keep things better. If we've really got to keep the hallucinations down as much as we can. And night terrors. This is the, truly the first symptom we are now looking for with Lewy body, thanks to the Mayo Clinic. Night terrors, people with Lewy bodies, they have what we call a REM sleep disorder. They never hit that REM sleep at night. And their nightmares, their dreams, become real. They're kicking, they're screaming, they're punching in their sleep. Their sleep partner's getting beat up, all, not on purpose, but through all the commotion. They're sleepwalking, they're yelling at walls and stuff, talking to people, dealing on it. We now know, since the Mayo Clinic, this starts 10 to 15 years before any symptoms of dementia. So if, you're, if your loved one is going through all these night terrors, right, and if dementia shows up in their future, the doctor needs to know about this. Because this right there will stop them from being diagnosed with Alzheimer's when this is, that is truly the sign of Lewy bodies we're looking for now on it. It's really the first symptom of the Lewy bodies. <laughs> 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 
It gets difficult if they have trauma through their life, so that you don't know where it's coming from. But if they're kicking and they're screaming and it, and it gets really vivid on their dreams, this is a sign of Louis bodies on it. Don't say. Use it to clean their sinus palates. If they think there's something burning, they're having smell hallucinations. Have them breathe them in. It'll help clean their sinuses. And it takes that one hallucination. 90% of the time, that will work. I'm sorry. No. No. The, here's the biggest problem with Lewy body dementia. It is extremely medication sensitive. All right? So even an over-counter Benadryl will take them for a ride. We have no cure. It's terminal. Matter of fact, every dementia we're going to talk about right now is terminal. We need to understand we have zero survivors. I'm just being straight out on this. I've got to be honest about this with these diseases. I'm sorry. It's going to give them a better life, lifestyle. The better quality of life you give them, the longer they're going to last, and the better, can, better for everybody. But we're going to get to that one, too, on just a minute on it, right? I'm sorry, I can't hear. So there is some sleeping medication that might work, but with the Lewy bodies, it's, play, it's give and play. This might work for one patient a little bit, but most medications like that can make it worse. So we've got to be careful with that with the Lewy bodies on it. Benadryl is not good for the people. Holodol, stuff like that. So even, on, even some of these over-counter cough medicines will take the people with Lewy bodies for a ride. A good neurologist knows all this. I can't promise you you're, gonna, you're seeing the right one. Robin Williams wasn't. I mean, it was just the only. We are getting better at this. I mean, we didn't realize what was going on with the Lewy bodies. The numbers in Lewy bodies are on fire right now. The disease isn't building. We're just getting better at recognizing it. So, and we'll get more of the baby boomer things going on. If we could maybe get through this and do all the questions in the end with a mic so I can hear better at the end, we could get through this because I'm really having a hard time hearing you. I know you're having a hard time hearing me. It's worse on this end. So, all right. Because over there, I couldn't barely hear what they were saying on it. So if we want to write them down some questions, I won't leave till everything's answered. I promise you that. My I don't have a flight out of here till 2 o'clock tomorrow. So I'm yours. <laughs> all right. All right. Front temporal lobe dementia. I just want to talk about it quickly. This is a, a generation of your front temporal lobe, your temporal here, or your front temporal lobe on this. This is really prime 40 to 60 years old on this. We see them sometimes 70 or 80. I've seen it in the 20s. I just met a man in St. Petersburg, Florida, 36 years old, already in long-term care with front temporal lobe on it. So it's another young one on it. On it. You're going to see a decline in behavior on this with this on it, with this front temporal lobe here. Right up here is all our social filters. So you've got the sweetest woman in the world who never swore in her life is now calling everybody a four-letter word. Like, where did this all come from? You got a gentleman, he's in a five-star restaurant, and he just spits on the floor. That right, right or wrong filter is right here with our executive functions. It's disintegrating. All right, so what happened to these people? They get sent to behavior health. All right. Most people with FTD, they'll go through five or six diagnoses before they get it correct. Because they're all bipolar depression. All this stuff gets thrown at them on it. So unfortunately, this is one of them with a good PET scan will show the degeneration of the lobe. But that's like last resort because most insurance don't want to pay for it is right off the bat. They're going straight to the behavioral health issues. Let's give them medication. Let's deal on it. All right. The lingual, yeah, my other friend talked about this, but with FTD, you will see a lot of language problems, what we call primary progressive aphasia. On this. I got a friend of mine from Tulsa, Oklahoma. She just passed away. 58 years old, she just died of FTD. On it. She told me a couple years ago, she said, Gary, I just want a t shirt saying, I am not drunk. Because she was slurring her words, missing words. Remember in grammar school, finish the blank of this, missing that blank of the sentence, fill it in. Every, every sentence she was was missing two, three words. Kind of stuttering a little bit on it. What happened to her in the end? She started losing all the words coming in too. It went to a two-way street for her on it. So this is, this is tough, very frustrating. We don't have any good medication for this. Because what happens is all your front up lobe degeneration, all the behavior medications they would give you, it kind of like limits them and takes that away from them on that. So it's one we kind of let run its course. Now vascular dementia, I want to talk about just for a minute too. What do you think about when I say vascular dementia? Heart attack, stroke, right? You should. You could have a stroke and have vascular dementia immediately. I want you all to understand that my mother who just died of vascular dementia last year, 
It all came out of her diabetes. Years and years of her feet being so swollen that she couldn't even get shoes on was stopping the circulation up through here all the way to here. Anything that is going to reduce the circulation of oxygen and nutrition to the brain is going to become a risk factor. Obesity, smoking, high cholesterol, all that is going to come, become a risk factor on this. All right? But here's what I want you to all think about now. Thanks to the Mayo Clinic, again, we now know that sleep apnea is a major cause of vascular dementia. The numbers are 50% of people with sleep apnea will develop vascular dementia. If you stop breathing two, three minutes at a time, 20, 30, 100 times a night, what do you think that's happening up here? Anybody that's told to wear a CPAC mask, please, this is why you want to wear it. Right? We've got to keep that circulation, that oxygen to the brain. Right? These are all different things. Loud snoring. And for the women that say they don't snore, <laughs> I got news for you. More women have sleep apnea than men. Right. So I'm just not pointing fingers here, but it's a fact on that, on it, right? All right. Every cell in our body requires oxygen, but the brain takes up 25% of all of our oxygen. And think of this. It only takes five minutes of oxygen deprivation to create permanent brain damage. So if you've got sleep apnea and you start breathing two, three minutes at a time, you're almost there. Right? So if you've got this stuff, we know how to treat vascular. Vascular could be reversed if we catch it early enough, but in most cases, the damage is probably there a little bit on it. So, on it. And then we've got mixed dementias. Let's just say you get two people with Alzheimer's diagnosed right at the same time. One person's gradually declining like he should. The other person just drops off the charts. What's the difference between patient one and patient two? Who's to say he doesn't have Alzheimer's and vascular dementia? Or Alzheimer's and Lewy bodies? Or Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, and from temporal lobe? I've known several people that have three different dementias. Personally, I know. Very rarely is it caught. Because once they get the Alzheimer's put on their forehead, <laughs> then in their charts, they stop looking for the other dementia. So please make sure all your family history is included when you go into, did your mother have sleep apnea? Did they have diabetes in the family? Did you have any cardiac problems in the family line? This all has to be included on this. The vascular, yes. Blood thinners, oxygen levels. Not doing it. The other one, we have nothing to slow down any of these progressions of diseases. We do have things like the Aerocept and the Mender, the Exxon patch, that helps control some of the symptoms. But it does not slow the progression. We're not there yet. Right? And alcohol-related dementia. This is known as Kosakoff syndrome. This is the last one I'm going to talk about, then we're going to move on to caring. All right? Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm in these nursing homes. I can't tell you how many people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's when it is, is alcohol-related dementia. All right? Can I pick on you for a minute? All right. What's your name? Eli. Eli goes to the doctor. He goes to the doctor. I put, every time I put them down, I forget everything, man. I'm losing everything. He goes, well, Eli, are you a heavy drinker? He's like, no, I'm just a social drinker. <laughs> Eli's been drinking a bottle of vodka every day for 30 years. <laughs> what that has done is depleted all of his vitamin B1 out of his system. Remember, we talked about the vitamin B, right? And dealing. So if he, Eli would have been honest with the doctor. Sometimes we're, doctors are one of our best friends. We don't want to disappoint them. Right? But if Eli would have been honest, he goes, yeah, I drink a bottle a day. So Eli, no more. You gotta, can't drink a bottle a day. We're going to put you on B1 infusions. And there's a 60% chance you're going to get some of your cognitive health back if the damage isn't there. But so most people aren't telling the doctors the truth, and now they're diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Because this disease truly mimics Alzheimer's disease. It really does. On it. Little chart. I won't go through this. Well, I will go through this in a minute. That, this is how these diseases flow. That black line that's going down like steps. I don't know if everybody can see the chart. It, vascular dementia will like, go like this. It drops. It parallels. It drops. It plateaus. It drops. Right? That yellow line that's swooping slowly, that's your Alzheimer's disease. You've got a gradual decline. This purple line that's peaking, that's your Lewy bodies. With Lewy bodies, you can have a really good three, four days. Nothing wrong with me, they're telling you. And then hang on. Because the next three, four days, here comes the hallucinations, the dementia, the night terrors. Everything kicks in, and they peak really high. And every time they peak high, they, they, come, they drop lower. And if you notice, that purple line ends before the other one. It's a faster-moving dementia on that. Short-term memory. The man already covered this, so I won't go through this on it. Now we're going to talk about you guys. Because I'm worried about you. All right? And here's the thing. Even when you... Yes? 
Now, if cirrhosis, depending on what's caused it, whether it was from medication or alcohol, yeah. right. No. I'm not sure what you mean on that. I'm sorry. I've never heard of it causing the dementia on it. No, I could be wrong on that on it. Cirrhosis of the liver caused by alcohol, you've got two things going on there. If it's coming from another type of, of uh, medications, like if people have hepatitis and all that, they get part of the liver gets damaged on it, that's not the same thing. Right, so so I, know, I know I'm not probably answering that right, but I might I'm not be getting it correct on that deal on it. Yeah, that's not. From the second, from the liver. Well, if you ask me right there, my my guess is it's going to cause some type of cognitive issue. On it, right? I can't, I can't, I can't answer that 100. percent I don't want to give a wrong answer that I don't know. On it. All right. We're going to try to do this all in the end if we could. I don't want to keep you guys sitting for three hours. I want you guys to get this through a little bit on it. No. But they are filming this, and they're going to make that available to everybody. Oh. Okay? Hi. <laughs> they're on camera, everybody. All right. So here's the thing. When it comes down to the point where you say you can't take care of these people, maybe you can, maybe you can't. I got this woman. She's about five foot two. All her sons and daughters are telling, Dad, Mom, you've got to put Dad in a home. You can't do this anymore. She goes, I can't do that. So I asked the woman. I go, how many times have you called 911? She goes, this month. He's six foot four. She's five foot two. He falls on the floor. She can't even pick him up. I kept my dad home right to the end. But you know what? I could pick my dad up like a rag doll. Different situation on this. So I got a woman in East Florida, East Coast of Florida. Her husband is now in a facility two miles from the house. And she goes and visits this man every single day. And every day when she leaves, she's bawling her eyes out in that parking lot. For two years, she's been doing this. Crying. She's crying and crying because she feels like she's abandoned him and she's left him with strangers. I know the facility this man's in. Right? It, it's an extremely good facility. It's probably the best place you could have picked on it. But this is stuff is tough on it. You've got to be careful with this stuff on it. We need to understand there's two patients involved. You've got the person with dementia and you've got the caregiver on this. And I wish doctors would understand this. You go and you bring your loved one to the doctor. Well, he's getting paid for the person with dementia. He should be turning around and looking at who drove him there. Because this person could be worse. The stress involved with these diseases is extreme. We'll leave that because my ga that man took my thing with the water jug. <laughs> I was going to do the same thing on that one. On it. Stanford University statistic, 45% of people, dementia-related disease caregivers, will die of a stress-related disorder before their loved ones. I've been doing this for 20 years. I lost count 10 years ago on how many caregivers I've personally known that died. I hate to say this, but I could go to a funeral every week. I go to very little because that's just, you know. And the, sometimes it's the person with dementia, but a lot of times it's the caregiver. And before, on it. We've got to be careful with the stress involved in this. On it. Caregiver syndrome is the new political term for caregiver burnout. I'm doing hospital training. I was just on the, yesterday, I did a two hour session a three-hour session or a video conference with a hospital in Iowa, in Cedar, Cedar Rapid Falls, or Rapid Falls, Iowa, dealing on it. This is the term that the hospitals and doctors are using on this. Here's the thing. Due to the physical and mental demands of caregiving, studies have found high elevated, elevated levels of stress hormones circling through caregivers' bodies, almost identical to post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's the thing. You get coming home from war with post-traumatic stress, we know to take care of you. You get in a severe trauma situation, we know to take care of you. We've got to start looking at this differently. If the caregivers are doing this, okay, let's be honest here. These are the symptoms of caregiver syndrome. These are the exact same system of post-traumatic stress disorder. How many people in this room have at least one of these? I could say two, but no hands are coming down, right? All right, so if you have the exact same symptoms, we really got to look at this different. Because I want you guys to make this to the end. Because we're everybody's counting on us, right? But we got to do stuff right. And when we're going to go from here on out, we're going to talk about how doing stuff's right on this. On this, I'm going to tell you something. Once a caregiver, always a caregiver. 95% of the time, there's always that handful. But when their loved one is gone, this is tough. You might have just—I spent 12 years with my dad, 24/7 a day. 
I was even bringing him to work with me. I mean, we were together. When that man died, I had no clue what to do with myself. And I was looking to go around and heal anybody. My mother came six months later. I'm like, oh, thank God, I got somebody else now, man. I hate to say it like that, but it was true. The cat's sneezing, and I'm running across the room with a handkerchief because I'm worried about the cat. The plant's dying. I'm trying to fix the plant. I started going to more support groups after my dad died than before. And it wasn't for me. It was to go to help the other people. So once a caregiver is always a caregiver, as we go through this on it. And how do we go and get our life back when they're gone? Right? We've got to think about this stuff on it. I'm not going to drill and go bad on this stuff, but there is, here's the thing. 50% of dementia-related disease caregivers will go through two to three years of depression after their loved one is gone. Those are the numbers. All right. So I want you to be out volunteering. I want you to get your life back. I got a woman I was speaking in Maryland, in Baltimore. She goes, can I talk to you at the end of the event? I said, yeah. She goes, what's going on? She goes, all my family's worried about me. I'm like, well, what's happening? She goes, well, my husband died two years ago. I said, yeah. And she goes, well, they're worried because I go to the, the cemetery too much. I'm like, what do you call too much? She goes, every day. <laughs> For two years, she's been going every day. And I'm like, well, now I see why they're a little concerned. Right? So I asked her, I said, what happens when you're there? I mean, are you crying? Are you depressed? She goes, no, it's the best part of my day. I bring a lunch. She had a memorial park bench made. She sits out there. Does it? So I don't have a real problem with that. Only if, if her friends are calling, hey, will you come to lunch? No, I have to go to the cemetery. Now I have a problem. All right. All right. I mean, so you've got to get out and you've got to stay social. We've got to dig Mr. Social out of the ground and put him back up there, and that's you guys on it. Volunteerism is fantastic. Churches, hospitals, anywhere you can volunteer, it's going to put you back. Most caregivers will quit their job to care of their loved ones. Right? I mean, I, my employment went down to almost nothing at the end, man. I came out of this financially broke the first round. It took me years to build it all back up on this on it. So who do you think is going to hire you when you haven't worked in three, four, five years? That's the biggest red flag on a, a resume. Go and volunteer. Go to United Way. Volunteer for six months. Put that on your resume. I am still a team player. And you're back on a schedule. You're getting off the couch. <laughs> you got to get out of that house. Everybody's like, well, how long is too long to grieve? You can grieve anywhere. Right? I did this. I do another presentation called The After Effects of Caregiving. And I was over there, and the woman calls me up the next day. She goes, hey, Gary, guess where I'm grieving? I'm like, where? The beach. <laughs> I'm like, good for you. Right? You don't have to do it in the house. Anyway. All right. So one out of five people are going to live with dementia or under the radar. The doctors aren't going to diagnose it. It took me two years to get my dad diagnosed. My dad's doctor was one of his best friends. Right? I mean, he, the guy used to come to the house and visit all the time, Dylan. I mean, the guy was just, they were friends. So here's my dad. I got him a 20-minute drive from my house to the doctor's appointment. My dad's a complete mess right over here at the house. But by the time I get to the doctor, He's running in there going, hey, how you doing? Telling jokes and everything. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> right? This doctor looked at me and he put my finger, his finger in my face one day and says, son, you're over-exaggerating this. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm with this man 24-7. I know the problem here on this, on it, right? This doctor retires. The man who took over his practice, the very first appointment, this man looked at me and he goes, dude, you got a problem here. I'm like, where have you been for two years? Because honestly, the first two years of these diseases is the most important time to get these people on the right track. All the medication we have now usually only works best in the beginning stages of the disease. We lost that. So just my point here is just don't let these doctors push you around. We know when there's something wrong. We have that feeling inside. Don't let them talk you out of it. On it. So we've got to be careful on this on it. But I want you to understand what was happening here. That ride from the doctor, right? So about that, from my house there, the dopamine, the adrenaline was pumping through my dad's brain. And by the time he gets to the doctor, he could hold himself together for 10, 15 minutes without a problem. Right. They're going to fool you in the early stages of the disease. I, I do police training. I do sheriff training all over the state of Florida for the sheriff's department. And this is one thing I stress to him. Hey, I just talked to me, and he's fine. Ten minutes ago, please go back and talk to the family. All right. And go back, talk to the guy again. Maybe ten minutes later, you might see a whole different reaction on this. So we've got to be careful in the early stages. Eventually, the disease are going to progress, and they're not going to fool you as much. Right? And if possible, please always look for baselines. Right? All of a sudden, they're way over right here. They're doing pretty good. And all of a sudden, they jump way over here. This is not a disease like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's doesn't move. The only disease that's peaking like that is the Lewy body. So to me, the first thing in my mind, 
UTI, urine tract infection. There is obviously something else on top of the disease that has brought them to that point. So we can't keep blaming everything on the Alzheimer's disease or whatever they got on it. So then they, they end up in an emergency room, all this stuff, they get Baker acted, all this stuff happens from a urine tract infection. They don't belong in behavioral health for a urine tract infection. They need the right antibiotics. On it. So I'm, we're training, for, I'm doing EM, EMT, the paramedics, all that. I go look for the baseline. Three, four weeks ago, where were they? You always got to keep that in mind. And then entering 911. All right? Here's the deal. <laughs> Police, the sheriff department calls me up at my house one day and goes, Gary, you have to stop your mom from calling 911. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, three times today. You know why she was calling? She no longer recognized the inside of the house and she was calling for somebody to give her a ride home. But here's the thing. You get dementia. You want to call all your friends. You can't remember any of their numbers. What three numbers do you think are coming to your mind? We've been drilling 911 to people's heads since 1980. Little kids like this, 911, 911. So of course it might be the last few numbers they remember in the end on this. And the four letter words. Those kind of stick to the end sometimes on this, aren't they? All right, so I'm what we're telling the police. You walk in the house, we're looking for environment. All right, stacks of unopened mail, expired food, no food in the fridge, all signs we can look for. You can walk into somebody's bathroom and know whether they got proper hygiene or not. That tub has, this cobwebs in the tub. Nobody's showered in or even in that one for a while, right? So we see these signs we're looking for on it. Signs of unnourishment. If they're not feeding themselves, they might not be feeding their pet. If the cat walks by and he's this skinny, there's a problem going on, right? My dad, I walk into my kitchen one day. My dad, he's, he's always yelling, feed the cat, you feed the cat. I look down, there's five bowls of cat food on the floor. I'm like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. My, dad, my cat's walking around with a belly as big as mine. All right? And my dad's still yelling, did you feed the cat? <laughs> I'm like, dad, man. You know? But this is a problem, too. All right? Suspiciousness, they're going to call and say, you stole their mail. They stole your, my, stole my money. You stole my stuff. M my mother was always wore this big book. Chrome, it was like a black nickel uh, cross on her neck. Always had it on her neck. For six months, she accused my sister of stealing that cross. You know where it was? The whole time. Could not convince her. My sister even went out and tried to buy another one that looked like it. Didn't work. Why didn't even go in that way, man? Wasn't happening on it. So this is stuff we see on it in the refrigerator magnet. This is what I train all the police officers. You can walk into somebody's house and you look at their fridge. They get all the magnets, everything. Business cards, doctor's appointments. They get half their life history on that fridge. Does anybody know what this is? You know what a foul life is? It's got a magnetic strip on the back. All right? This goes on your fridge. Paramedics, police, they're all trained to walk in the house, they look at the fridge on it. If they're not trained, I'm training them for this. Inside this little file right here, doctor's names, the diagnosis, medications, all that stuff. How many times do you think a paramedic gets to the house and the patient's non-responsive? How are they going to get the right information? Honestly, it's the same thing with dementia. How are they going to get the correct information on the person with dementia? I want you guys to have two of these. Police departments, emergency rooms, fire departments, they usually give them out for free. On it. If not, you can go to uh, folife.org on it. Two, please. One for the person with dementia, one for you. One for the caregiver on it. It's important to have this stuff together at these, at these moments on it. So now we're going to talk about these people with dementia. Routine, routine, routine is number one. Why is it so important? The fact that they lost their short-term memory for one. Because they lost their short-term memory. Uh, the other man went through the short-term memory. Normally I talk about that, but he already covered it, so I left that alone on dealing it. But you know, if you don't know what happened two minutes ago, dealing it, here's the problem with these diseases. The biological clock in the circadian cycle is dissolving all the time that the disease is progressing. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? You know? All this stuff is happening to them because they don't have that memory, that short term is dissolving on this, on it, on it. But routine. I used to use a little blue bowl for my dad's pills every morning and every evening. If I tried to hand them to him or put them on a different plate, he's screaming at me, you're trying to poison me. <laughs> These aren't the pills I took yesterday. They were the exact same pills, but in a different setting. Keep everything in patterns, please, as much as you can. One doctor's appointment, my dad wasn't a mess just that day. He was a mess for maybe two, three, four days sometimes, just from the upset of the routine on it. So this is what I want you to try to find, that happy medium between routine and socialism. 
We've got to keep these people social. The people that lock these people at home, I did this with my dad at first. I think I'm going to be the I'm going to be the safety guy. I'm going to make sure he's home and he's safe. No, I should have had him out in public. I should have had him out there socializing, and I didn't do that the first round because I didn't know. Now well, you got to try to do adult daycares and all that stuff. Man, is very good for him. If you wait too long, you're not going to be able to get him to go. You got to be proactive with this. But socialism is very important. It's the, one of the only things we really have that keeps their symptoms at bay for a little while on it. So. And anxiety. There's nobody with these diseases. Routine's number one. This is number two. We're going to talk about the big three here on this. All these people have anxiety. My mother's anxiety was extreme. I mean, it was bad. My dad had anxiety, but my mom was extreme. She'd sit in a chair just like this going, ah, ah. And because of her anxiety being so high, it brought in other problems. We'll get there on that too on it. So here are some, uh, some symptoms I want you to watch for identifying anxiety. Problem sleeping. How many of us had a big interview in the morning, a big test in the morning, now it's or an early flight, and it's 3, 4 in the morning and we're still wide awake? Like, my goodness, i got to get some sleep. i got a big appointment in the morning. This is anxiety keeping you up, right? This could be a daily part of these people's life. If they're tossing and turning all night long, it could all be anxiety related, right? Cold, sweaty hands and feet, shortness of breath, heart palliation. The inability to sit still and calm is what we think about with anxiety, but that's only a piece of it, all right? The dry mouth, I want to caution you. If they get the white caressing on their lips and all this, this could be anxiety related, but it also could be a side effect from another medication. If they're already on an antidepressant, this could be another side effect from that, but if not, it's something to look for. And the numbness and tinging in their hands. If they're telling you their hands and, nines, their hands and feet keep falling asleep, you got dementia and your hands are tinging, tinging, tinging like this, Get the needles, what do you think that's going to do? You ever hear this saying, my anxieties have anxieties? <laughs> this one symptom is just going to take their anxieties and just make double fold and make it worse and worse. So we've got to be careful with this stuff. I don't want any of these people over medicated, but sometimes we have to address some of these symptoms. And anxiety is one of them. My mother was on a 0.25 Xanax in the morning, 0.25 in the evening. The prescription was rooted as needed. <laughs> There were days where I gave her a little bit more. She needed a little bit more. But it was just a really light dose just to tone her down a little bit. So we don't want them over-medicated, but we've got to do this right. And this is the big three. I'm sorry, but there's nobody with these diseases that aren't going through bouts of depression. Right? And like I said, everything we talked about, these are terminal diseases. Just the fact that you're being diagnosed, how depressing is that? Then you're watching your family dissolve. You're not recognizing your children. Trust me, this is depressing stuff. I walk in the kitchen one day, my dad's got his head on the table like this. I'm like, are you okay, dad? He's put his head up and he's got tears. I'm like flowing tears down the side of his face. Now I'm like, okay, now I'm depressed. This is my hero. I'm watching my, I'm watching my dad cry, man. I'm like, this, this is bad. Like, doctor, come over here, man. <laughs> I need help too on this, right? We gotta be careful of this because this is what we're not realizing. That the depression by itself can create symptoms of dementia. So let's say now you get the dementia coming out of the Alzheimer's, and now you get dementia coming out of the depression, and we stack the two on top of each other, and you wonder why there's such a cognitive mess? Yeah. I don't have to tell you people. Depression can, clinical depression will, can be very bad for dementia, and it might, not, might stick with you the rest of your life on this. Depression can mimic and cause symptoms of dementia. But you know what? You know how many caregivers have asked me, is, dementia, is Alzheimer's contagious because I think I have it? Well, guess what? Guess where that dementia is coming from? The depressed caregivers. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. The more it's in your family line. I've got a family that lives just north of me. All seven siblings have Alzheimer's. So, my family, my grandmother, my dad, and you're the first crowd I ever told this to, but I've been diagnosed now with MCI. Mild cognitive impairment. And it's probably the early stages of Alzheimer's. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> you're the first, I don't believe I even said that, but you're the first people I admitted to because I was just diagnosed two months ago with it. So I need to get all this stuff out now <laughs> as we go. So the dementia patients, is it always that they're not recognizing people? Yes. <laughs> For a poor point they do on it, the earlier stages of it. And, the, and I hate to say that, but the younger they, they have it, 
they seem to be a little bit more aware of a lot of some stuff than some of the seniors do on it. But somebody wasn't listening. Okay, and redirection, is this is something I want you guys to learn to use as a tool, all right? I can say, hey, that, that gray sweater you're wearing, that looks really good on you. I can see she's snowballing. I see all the confusion building. That wasn't, a st that wasn't a question, it was a statement. Those words are probably, oh, you like this? Now she'll probably want to wear that shirt for five days. I can actually live with that, I'm a little on it, right? But the, eventually those words are going to stop working. But that's what that'll work in the beginning. A little quick short statement might turn them around, so, you know, you see everything building and snowballing. But eventually the words are going to stop because the disease has progressed. I want you to start going straight to their senses because this is the best redirectional tool in the world. And nobody's going to convince me different. All right? My dad's a complete mess. This is redirection through taste. My dad is a complete mess. And in the evening, I go get him a big bowl of vanilla ice cream, and I get 20, 30 minutes apiece. I hear that spoon hit the bottom of the bowl. I'm like, are you sure you don't want another one? Because <laughs> I'll go get the bucket, man. My job was, if I was going out of town or anywhere to do anything for a short period of time, to make sure that freezer was full. Here's what's happening in our hospitals and our facilities. They're running straight to the medicine cabinets when they should be running to the freezer. Here's an example. I made a horrible mistake one day. I made two doctor's appointments in one day. Right, thinking I'm going to get all done in one shot. This is my thinking. It became a disaster. My dad, I'm leaving the second appointment. I'm, he's opened the door as I'm driving, screaming at me, going, you don't even know where you're going. You're going the wrong way. I said, Dad, he had his seatbelt on, but he's opening the door. Man, you've got to close the door. I reach in my pocket. I get a thing of peppermint candy. I put one in my mouth. I unfold another one. I go, Dad, try this. Within a quarter of a mile, he didn't care where we're going because all he tasted was that peppermint. That's redirection through taste. Redirection through touch. You want to put something in their hands. You know what we're training? I'm training people in the hospital, the RNs. If Mr. Jones is giving you a hard time in the hospital, instead of running the medicine cabinet, go get a whole bunch of white towels, unfold them, and go, Mr. Jones, can you please help me? I'm so busy I can't even get to my next patient. Can you help me out? It's like, yeah, now you got me doing women's work. But you know what? Now he's got something in his hands. He's calming down. He's going, now he's got a chore to do. This is redirection. Redirection and taste and, and touch is huge, man, on it. And photo albums. Fantastic redirectional tool. I kept two photo albums on my kitchen table all the time. My dad was done eating, I'd pull, I'd slide the plate, I'd push that photo album in front of him. Right? He's going through all these black and white pictures of him as a kid, playing hockey in the university, doing it, right? telling me a completely different story of the same picture as last night. Who cares? I don't care about the story. Here's the other thing. You go visit your loved one in the facility, in the nursing home, and she doesn't remember who you are. Go home and get the wedding album. Right? She goes, what's this? I'm married to you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you got old. <laughs> yeah, we all get old. Man. But you know what? That wedding album is now going to create a whole new conversation for you. So not only did you redirect them with it, now you've got a whole conversation going with them on this. Good stuff. Right? And role playing. I know some of you have probably already been there, but I can't even almost describe how much it hurts when your loved one's looking at you and they no longer know who you are. I was with my dad 24-7. He didn't know who my sister was anymore. But they don't no longer know who you are, how painful this is for the person, the family, the caregiver. Right? So he didn't know who my sister was. He didn't know who my mother was anymore, his ex-wife. He didn't know any of his friends. I'm cooking him breakfast one morning. Right? I've got my back turned. I'm at the stove. He all I hear is, sir, excuse me, sir. <laughs> and I turn around, and he goes, who are you, and what are you doing in my house? And it's like somebody put a knife right through me. This stuff hurts. But here's what I want you to know. I walk out in the living room, I'm gone five minutes, I come back and my dad be like, Gary, where have you been? I've been waiting for you all day. I'm like, five minutes ago, you didn't know who I was. All right? So here, go with the flow on it. Now the synapses in their brain are not firing like ours. It takes detours. Everything is happening differently in there on it. This is the brain in the end stages. I won't leave that up there because it's not a good picture. But I'm going to tell you something. You can pick up the brain, the organ, and you can put your fingers right to it like Swiss cheese in the end. So there's a lot of detours, a lot of thought patterns to get to where they got to go on this one. I want you to go for the Academy Awards. If you become Bob and you're a female, I don't care. If you become Sue, you become Sue. You're not going to win the argument on this. As a matter of fact, I want you to act it out like the Academy Awards. I want you to work it. 
You don't go around and say, no, no, Dad, you know who I am, or Mom. That's not going to work. Your wife doesn't know. Your husband doesn't know. You've got to go with the flow for a little bit. The last two years of my dad's life, he thought I was dad. My father thought I was his father. I did not like this. This really, really bothered me. And then one day, it hit me a little bit. He looked at me and he goes, Dad, do I got to take these pills? And I'm like, son, if you don't take those pills, I am telling your mother. He's like, no, man. Now he's small. I'm like, holy smoke, somebody gave me some juice. <laughs> I could have used that 50 years ago. Also, just, you just go with it. 90% of the time, I was his dad. The 10%, you become Gary, you, you hold that in. All right. It's, it's hard, but you got to do this on it because if you don't, it's going to get worse. Go with the flow as we go through this on it. And the therapeutic lie, we have to talk about this. All right. My dad's the oldest of 17 kids. Large Canadian. My mother comes from a family of 12. All I'm going to tell you something. Those Canadians were a little out of control in the 20s. <laughs> I don't mean, they were busy, busy people, right? So here's my dad always asking me for Elfie, which was his second oldest brother. They grew up together. They went to school together. They played hockey on the same university and the same team together. Elfie went into World War II. He got shot up. He made it home, but he died 30 days after he got home. He never recovered from his injury. This man had been dead 60 years. And one day I said, Dad, Elfie's been dead for decades. His eyes rolled in the back of his head. He looked at me and he goes, what kind of family is this? You didn't even tell me about my brother's funeral? And this went on for days. I was like, great, that was a mistake. So I learned to lie a little bit. I said, Dad, I just talked to Elfie on the phone. He's probably going to be back tomorrow. He's coming back tomorrow. I go, he's probably going to be back tomorrow. But I got to caution you. Nobody likes being lied to. And just because they get dementia doesn't mean they should be lied to on it. Here's the question you need to ask. Is this lie in my benefit or theirs? Because it needs to be in theirs. If you're doing this to make your life easier, it's going to come back and bite you. We get this woman, she's looking out the window waiting for her daughter to come home from school. Her daughter's 45 years old, has four kids of her own, and three states away. She's not coming. The caregiver goes, oh, she'll be home in a couple hours. Don't worry about it. That woman stays at that window for another two and a half hours, and all of a sudden it triggers. That person just lied to me. We can't lose that trust. If it's going to stop them from wandering, if it's going to help them take medications, there is a time and place for this, but that's in their benefit. This gets way over abused. I see it this in nursing homes. I see it everywhere that's over abused. Because it does make your life easier at a point. But with nobody, you can't lose that trust. So just be cautious with this, please. Well, when do you know when to have to run out? What? <laughs> when you have to run out? No, when do you know when you should lie in the first place? When it's in their benefit to keep them safe or something medical on it. If you're doing this because you're tired and you're making this easy for you, this is, this is where it's going to come back on you. But if it's going to stop them from crossing the street, or if they're, something they're in a wandering kick, which we're going to get to in a minute, there's certain times, yeah, I say yes. But it has to be something to keep them safe and in their benefit. All right. There's a difference on it. So time traveling. All right. We find people sometimes in their houses that they sold 20 years ago, but they knew how to get back there on it, right? Sometimes you hear, I want to go home, I want to go home, I want to go home. Guy thinks if he goes back to Houston, Houston Texas, where he grew up, everything's going to go back to normal. It's not even about home. It's not even about a virtual place, a reality place still in it. You just want things to go back on this on it. My mother, I'm looking at everybody here with that big, long, gray beard here, right? I have purposely had to keep my beard short because the longer my beard got, the more grayer it got. And also my mother looked at me and she goes, don't even tell me you're Gary because Gary doesn't have all that gray in his beard. So I was still Gary, but I was Gary somewhere over here in her mind. And I can't tell you how many times I'd lay my dad down at night, and he'd look at me, and he goes, Dad, do I get school in the morning? So he's somewere way over here, right? And, you know, and I'm, the, I'm the adult now in the room, right? Right? Yeah, I don't know about that, but listen, this is not a big problem. All of a sudden, oh, it's 1.30 in the morning, and I hear like there's almost a fight going on in the bathroom. My dad's in the bathroom flipping out because there's an 85-year-old man in the mirror, and he's got school in the morning. All right, so this is something we've got to be cautious about. Time traveling, we can let go sometimes, but sometimes this can create wandering. So we've got to be careful with this. In the hospital settings, you know what I'm telling them? If you see a lot of time traveling, that white eraser board at the end of their bed, 2018 should be the biggest thing on that board. Something to bring them back in today's date a little bit. All right. Sometimes we can let this go, but we've got to be a little cautious with this. I just want to bring it up. And who knows about sundowners? All right.
All right. Sundowning, right? It's a heavier term for a heavier confusion and aggravation in the later part of the day. I want you to understand something. That's only a piece of what's happening. Who, what, when, where, why, from the minute they wake up to 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, would wear any of you people down physically and mentally. Add that on top of the sundowning. Because that time of the day, all day long, as soon as they get up, they're like, am I supposed to be here? What room am I in? Why am I in this room? It's going to physically wear anybody down. So they put all this together on top of the sundowning. The fact that my mother's anxiety was so extreme, her sundowning was something I've never seen before. My dad's sundown. My mother, hang on. We had a pattern. Four o'clock in the afternoon, we'd go sit out on the deck. I had enough shade. It was cooler. I grew. I had plants all over the deck, all the colors. She loved all the plants out there on it. On rainy days when we couldn't go out, that woman was a mess. She's just, whoa, screaming and moaning. It was intense. Her last hospital stay, day two, they came up to me and they go, holy smokes, this woman sundowns. I was like, yeah, and I told you that yesterday. <laughs> now you believe me, right? And they say, you know, here we go. This is what we do. Right? The main thing to do about sundowning, and we're getting there. The main thing, the number one thing to do about sundowning is you have to be proactive. If you know this person's sundowning at 5 o'clock, we start working on this at 3. Right? And I'm going to just back up for one minute. We just had daylight savings. This is not good for sundowning. Not good for any. So, you know, bottom line, it takes us maybe two, three days to adapt. It could take them a month. So what I tell most families, start turning the clocks back where they are sitting, maybe a week, a little bit ahead of time, and let them gradually get into the, the time change on it. So, so we've got to be careful on this on it. Increase the lights in their room. If you know they're sundowning at 5 or 6, at 3 o'clock we, we have all the lights on like this so the shadows don't come in. Right? One of the tips you can do on this. Keep them active. Get the photo album at 3 o'clock. Put something in their hands. Gradually keep them active and re 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 redirect it on this. Here's the deal. If they get into full sundowning, you can run to the freezer all you want to get the ice cream, and the ice cream is probably not even going to pull them out. Once they're in full sundowning mode, you're probably not going to get them out. So that's why you've got to be proactive. I'm sorry? Oh, because the electric bills are going up? That's sometimes you're going to work things around things a little bit on it. Right, yeah. So we got a grant money for our bill or something like that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lie. It's a lie, but maybe it's going to help them out a little bit on it. So but you, you, we can't fix everything, but we can do a good, good part on all this. And the other thing you want, music, man. Music therapy is extremely good for sundown on this. So. And shadowing. Shadowing is the act of a memory-impaired person keeping their caregiver in eyesight 24-7, all right? With my dad, the fact that I was his only caregiver, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I couldn't lose my dad if I tried. He was glued. I take a step back, and I am stepping on his toes. Doing it. I didn't even have to take a step back. I could feel him breathing on the back of my neck. I go in the bathroom, man. I was in the bathroom 30 seconds, and he's beating on the door. What are you doing in there? And half the time, I was just standing there getting my 30 seconds of peace because I knew what was coming. I'm dealing on it, man. Here's the thing. We, again, this is where the socialism comes in so much important. Right? Adult daycares, stuff like that. We've got to get them to use of But, you know, we've got to keep them going as much as we can. Same time, day, and we need to ask questions. This is when I'm training the facilities. I'm telling all the nursing staff facilities, you need to ask questions when the family's here. Because if Mr. Jones wanted to shave before the shower, if he's a, like me, I shave after. That's my routine. But if now I get to mention, they're trying to make me shave before, and then jump in the shower, the whole thing's going wrong right from the beginning. So we keep their patterns as long as we can as we go through this. They move into an assisted living, a nursing home facility. What are they doing? Mr. Jones has been home with blue or whatever, green pert shampoo in his hand for the last 15 years, and now they're trying to put all the strawberry stuff in his hand. All these little things matter as we go through this on it. And here's the bottom line. We're not trying to car, this isn't a car wash, man. We're not trying to pressure wash these people, man. Everybody's got these hoses, they get them on high, and like, Psh. this gets very frightening. I got a friend of mine in Sacramento, California. She's got Lewy body dementia. She told me, she goes, Gary, I am never, ever bathing or showering again. I'm like, does your husband know this? Because it won't be too long before he figures this out. She goes, you don't get it. The minute that water touches my skin, I go straight into hallucinations. 
she thinks cockroaches, ants, everything's crawling on her, just from the beads of water. So we've got to be careful with this stuff on it. She doesn't know it. She's, her mind is it's all hallucinations to her. All right. This is what I did at my house. I had a little note like this in my back pocket all the time. I got away from this for a good year. I was like, Dad, Tuesday, 9 o'clock. He's like, yeah, what's that mean? I was like, well, I got a note here from the doctor. Shower time, 9 o'clock on Tuesday. She's like, let me see that. I'd be like, <laughs> I put it right back in my pocket, man. I bring him to the doctor. And my dad's like, we're going to talk about this Tuesday. My doctors look at me like, what? I go, can I borrow a pad? <laughs> you use what you get, bottom line, as we go through this stuff on it. And the closet is simplicity. I want you guys to just keep their closing. Choices limit everything on choices. I don't want them waking up and looking in the closet and there's 30 dresses, 30 blouses, 30 pantsuits. I mean, we've limited it down to choices on them. Their mornings are going to be the best part of their day. If we're messing their mornings up all with their wardrobe, the whole day is going to go bad. So just keep this in mind. You can Google Alzheimer's closing, and you'd be surprised what pops up on this. And then giving up the car keys. Not going to go easy. I don't know what the laws are in New York, but in Florida, we have a medical reporting form. You stay anonymous on this deal. You stay anonymous on this. We have a, we have a thing in the Florida where you, could, you go into Florida, myflorida.com. You report the person saying that this person is driving with cognitive issues or something's wrong with them. They mandatory get a thing in the mail saying they have to take an on-road driving test. And they're going to fail. But your name stays out of it. That's the beauty of this on it. So, when I pulled my dad's license as, as the illness, guess what? He had 101 places to go every day. <laughs> He made me pay for it one way or the other, man. I'm like, okay, you didn't want to go anywhere for three weeks, and now that you're not driving, you're going to make me go here, there, there, and there. So this is how that stuff works out on you. We've got to talk about wandering for a minute, because this gets extremely dangerous on this. Six out of ten people with dementia are going to wander. All right? If not found in 24 hours, 48% become a fatality. It doesn't take 24 hours. I just taught a class to the Pasco County Sheriff's Department just south of me where I live on it. They just lost a man in 30 minutes. They get the call. By the time they get to the house, that man was floating in the retention pond in the back of the property, and that development dead. Things happen quick as we go through this on it. And wanderers become repeat offenders. If your loved one wanders once, you need to keep an eye on them from that point. Because sometimes it sets a pattern. 24-7 at this point on it. It gets pretty dangerous as we go through this on it. If they're not found in 72 hours, the survival rate's down to 20%. 20 Right now, we've got, I finally got a whole bunch of sheriff departments to work with me on getting new statistics. Because it's the difference between them being on foot in a vehicle is huge. I know here you might not be driving that much in New York City, but you're living out in the country, man. We're finding them maybe three, four days alive in Cincinnati because they drove across four state lines in a car, but we're not finding them alive after 72 hours on foot. The difference is huge on it. Just so just keep that in mind on it. Triggers to watch for background noise. Background noise is huge, right? How many people have here, you have a dog, and the doorbell goes off on the television, and that dog's barking at the front door? You can't think your loved one's not doing the same. I got law and order on my house. Police sirens are blasting on my TV. My dad's like, cops are here! I'm like, dad, it's the TV. Here's the thing. They hear that doorbell go off on the television, and they open that front door, and there's nobody there. What happens next? They step over that threshold. This is where bad things go on it. Exploring. Mr. Jones is looking out that window and he's like, who the heck put that park bench there? Well, it's been there for 15 years. Now he's out the door, he gives it a kick, and now he's down the road. Following. You can be in a lockdown dementia unit. The CNA goes and hits the code right here. She's out the door, and Mr. Jones is just in motion. He's just following her. Right? He doesn't know why, but he's following her. All these dementia units need to have a sign right here. Watch for tailgaters, because it happens quick. They're just in motion. They're following as they go. And exit seeking, this is what you see when you first put them in a facility, when you get them in a hospital. And they don't understand where they are, and they're just looking for any way out. They might not ever wanted before, but now they're in a brand new building where they don't even know where that building is or what it is to them. This is what you see when you call exit seeking on it. We need to understand the difference of elopement and wandering. Because elopement's in the earlier stages. Right? Elopement, they have enough cognitive ability to know where they're going. Mr. Jones is like, oh my goodness, I'm late for work. The man hasn't had a job in 15 years, but he knows exactly how to get back there. He's walking in the door trying to clock in at a job he doesn't even have anymore. This is in the earlier stages. This is the elopement part. 
My wife's waiting for me. She's been dead 10 years, but he's trying to get back to her. And he knows where they used to live. And I got to go home. We talked about that. The wandering, this is where the fatality comes put in play. This is in the late stages of the disease, right? They could just be in motion. We just got a woman last year in Brooksville, Florida. We got her. She was 100 yards from here all the way through the woods, through the vines, through the thorns. She was shredded. All cut up. You know how old seniors, they get their skins get so fragile? This woman was shredded. They had to get chainsaws to get her out. And the deputies were like, Gary, how did this woman go from here to there? And she was in motion. She was just walking in the owner. Who remembers the Carol Burnett show? Remember that character Tim Conway used to play? That old man just shuffling? This is her in motion. This gets extremely dangerous to this point, right? We need to consider at this stage, in the late stages of the disease, they probably have vision impairment too. No parallel, maybe tunnel vision. I want you all to do me a favor and put your hands like this. Now look down at your feet. How fast do you think you're going to get in trouble walking around like that? Doesn't take 24 hours on this, on it, right? What happens when you get lost? What happens when you get lost? Yeah, if you get dementia, you're probably not going to do that. <laughs> uh, most people, they get scared. You know what happens when you get scared? Yeah. You hide. So we're telling the police, you can't just go around with your window down going, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. You physically have to get out of the car and start looking for these people. Time is of the essence as we go through this on it. When starting a search for somebody with dementia, this is what we're training. This is what I'm training. 70% of the time, if Mr. Jones is right-handed, he's going to go down the end of the driveway and he's going to go to the right. Want to know why? Because he's moving on instinct. Right? We're teaching him in the hospital. You can't keep Mr. Jones in that hospital bed. He hits that hallway. He's going down to the right if he's right-handed. Their dominant hand needs to be in their charts, please. Because this could save their life. If they're right or left-handed, that should be in all their medical charts. And I know some people go, well, what if they're indidextrous? I'm like, there's always someone in the crowd. <laughs> I'm sorry? The more devices you have, the better, without a doubt. Some people can't afford it. I mean, there's a lot of fees involved in some of these uh, GPS deals. No, but I just wanted to say that our front door, back door, all the doors look like Fort Knox to my parents. Yeah. I was so drilling I a hole. My mother with rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, and thrombosis, if she couldn't get out the door, she climbed out the window. All right. Because where there's a will, there's a way. I was drilled. The deal, if you want to put a deadlock in, you want to keep it out of vision. So if you're tall enough, you put it up high. Thank you. If you're short, put it down on the bottom of the door. I'm drilling the hole at the top. My dad comes up behind me. and He goes, what are you doing? I'm like, well, that's so nobody can break in. He goes, oh, I like that. <laughs> Here's the deal. Hide a key outside. The first 10 days, I'm like, come on, let me in, man. He's like, who is it? <laughs> so he's like, go out there. He'd that, close that door, man. I was locked on the outside. My key is still hidden in the same spot. I'm not telling you where it is. All right. Okay, I need a volunteer. Somebody want to help me? One of you guys want to help me? I won't hurt you. Come on up. You're very welcome. You're missing the good part. <laughs> I know it's been a long night. So, okay. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. He's Mr. Jones. Mr. Saul, whatever we'll call me in here, right? I'm Officer Joe. I've been looking for him. You know what I tell the police? There's something you guys all have to understand. That uniform that they worked so hard to wear, it means nothing to this man. Anxiety's up to here. He's lost. He's scared. The confusion. He's peeking. That police car I'm driving, it means nothing. So they can't think like that. We've got to do something like that. So if I go and I see Mr. Jones, I finally find him. He's walking down the street. He's been wandering. I go, hey, how you doing? If I go anywhere near this man's face, what do you think is going to happen? Nicest guy in the world, but I'll probably get fisticuffs. Always come down low. Mr. Jones, we've been looking for you. Everything's going to be okay. Then I want you to switch hands. I'm not going to pull him, but he'll follow me. He'll follow me around to where i got to go. Now, how am I even going to get him sitting in the police car? How am I going to get him sitting anywhere? We just keep moving him. And when I get him to where I want him to be, I go down. <laughs> not to the floor. The fact that he's moving on instinct, all I could do is buckle his knees. You can use this at home. 
We're teaching this in the hospitals. Now, if you were my other friend over here drinking vodka, I'd have to haul you in. But we're going to let you go today on a warning. Thank you on this. All right. You can use this at home. You want to get him in a seat? Now, that doesn't mean that man's going to stay there. But at least I'm getting him to sit in a position. Just enough to go down to buckle. Yeah, well, then you <laughs> there's always one in the crowd. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, same thing on it. You just gradually, I would do both hands and lift like this. But you're having my foot on the forearm. Yeah, and you know what a gate belt is too on it? Sometimes something, a little bit of gate belt just to give him a little move on it. You know what a gate balance belt is? It's something for a little bit of physics involved. You wrap it around their waist loosely. So you hold them, you grab them from the sides of the belt like this. And when they're walking, they're unsturdy. On it, all these people should be, they're all going to be risk for fall on this, on it. And if you've got Lewy bodies, you're really going to be risk for fall. It increases a lot with that disease on it. on it. Okay, when their sleep patterns are upside down, just think this, this is progression. They're sleeping all day and up all night. This is signs of progression on it. Right. His, right, and also if they're, if they're up all night long and you're sleeping, you're going to get a problem. <laughs> Anybody that thinks that bad things don't happen to people with dementia at night, they, they haven't took care of them very long on it. So, so basically the biological clock and all that is disintegrating. So to get to a point. No, you want to keep them in patterns. Like we talked about routine and patterns. I understand that. Well, what time are they getting up? What time are they getting up in the morning? At the beginning of the day. At 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, are they up or sleeping? Up. They're still up, yes. But right. they think it's the night. That's a, their progression's gone out far in that point. Uh, my dad in hospice on the end would go 30 hours, sleep for two, and go another 30. Because the biological clock, because the biological clock is not functioning properly anymore. That's what's happening to these people. This is pure progression. This, this means the disease is way more advanced than we're probably thinking. Obviously, she is having problems sleeping if she's saying she's up at 2 in the morning. Maybe you can. I would only caution you to be careful on their balance with that. So. All right, restaurant setting. I wanted to take these people out social. We talked about this on it. Here's what we're not thinking about. Me and you are sitting in this booth. We're having a perfect conversation. But now you've got dementia. All right. and you're trying to hear everything I want, I'm trying to say. Go ahead. You're welcome. But your ear to brain filter is dissolving too. So you can't filter out all the other voices in that room. You're trying to hear everything I'm saying, but you're hearing everything else. Me and you could sit in that booth and you, you, you've got it all filtered out. This is not working as the diseases progress. So we see a lot of behavior problems in the restaurant. I want these people social. Let's we'll skip through that. The sounds of dementia is something we're not thinking about. I got a friend of mine, he goes, Gary, I can't go to Walmart no more. You go, what's going on? Every time he goes to Walmart, he grabs that shopping cart with that bad wheel. Da -da 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 right? You're going through the walls, nailing it. Kids are yelling at their parents over here. They got music coming out of the ceiling. He goes, I got to turn around and run. I got to go right back to the vehicle. I can't do this on it, man. So there's something we got to realize. The filter, ear to brain, this dissolves on them too on it. So, and the reflection of dementia. It took me over a year to figure out what was going on with dad. Every time my dad went into the bathroom to urinate, he would call me in within 30 seconds. Right? And I thought this was balance. I'm literally, I could put an X on the floor. He wanted me to stand right here. I'm standing right there and I'm holding him by his belt so he wouldn't fall forward. And then one day he turned around and he goes, what is that man doing standing there? The whole time there was a full length mirror. In this little private time that we're all supposed to have in the bathroom, there was some stranger, which was him, watching this man urinate. He goes, that's what this has been all about? So that mirror is gone. Right? Yeah, you can remove the mirrors, you do stuff. There's a facility up in northern Florida that I trained. They put four by eight mirrors down all the halls for re remodeled. They couldn't get one person with dementia to go into the dining room. One woman's getting platonic. She says, that is the most evilest woman. Follow me. And she turned right back around and go back in her room. They had to rip all this. These buildings have to be put together correctly for people with dementia. We know much more now on this. We really do know much more in this deal. Some of these buildings are 30, 40 years old. They're still designed the old way. And I see brand new buildings not being built correctly. They got, I call Las Vegas carpets. They get all the swirls, all those fancy carpets. I'm sorry, but if you've got Louis bodies, those swirls are going to become snakes. And it's going to just trigger one hallucination after the other as you go through stuff on it. 
So we got to be careful with this stuff on it. Eating dilemmas, I'll just leave it at this. You know the best way I get my dad to eat? I had to sit across the table and eat with him. If I put a plate in front of him and think I'm going to go do my chores and laundry and all this stuff, forget it. Nothing was touched. But if I sat across the table from him, we had a conversation, I miss those days. But that man would finish his whole meal on it. And paste, taste buds atrocity. They're going to lose their changes of taste. There's nothing wrong with giving them the dessert first because sometimes the sugar and the sweetness kicks everything for them and then they'll finish their whole meal. Right. So something to think about and getting these people to eat on this. And we've got to keep an eye on their swallowing. They're all going to come down with dyslexia in the end of these. My mother couldn't even get a piece of rice down in the end. So please keep an eye on this stuff as we go. On it. All dental and eye work, please done right when they're diagnosed. If you think you're going to get Mr. Jones in a dental chair at the end stage of the disease, I promise you it's not going to happen. So before they ever get into a facility or nursing home, way before that, but definitely before they get into a facility, you need to make sure that all this stuff's taken care of as we go. And please keep an eye on this. is not a nice subject, but please keep an eye on their bowel movement. I almost killed my dad. My dad was impacted, we figure, for maybe 40 days. He's telling me, no, I went two days ago. I went two days ago. By the time we get this man into the hospital, they had to resection 12 inches of his colon because he was cemented. It was a mess as they on it, on it. But here's what we don't think about. These people, when most of them are dying of Alzheimer's and these diseases like that, they die of organ failure. The brain starts telling the organs how to function. The colon is the first organ to start getting sluggish. Right? So I didn't do a thumbs up on my calendar, but I put a B. B for bowel movement, right? Nailing on it, right? If there's no B for three, four days, we've got to start taking action. They got to maybe go on a softener. On it. We don't want to get to the point of suppositories all the time. So sometimes they may even have to be on a light laxative at the end during the day on this stuff. But we got to keep an eye on this. Everybody thinks John Wayne died of lung cancer. The man died of being impacted. If it killed the Duke, what do you think it's going to do to a little old lady, right? right? So we please be careful with this on it. You gotta, you gotta try to keep an eye on them. Most times you're gonna end up wiping and helping them clean themselves up a little bit at this point. So you might see this stuff. My dad wasn't telling me the truth and that's what caused me the problem on it. With my mom, trust me, I was on it. And she had the exact same problem too. We had this woman on a laxative daily at the end on it. So. I want all you people, this gets very important right here, what I'm gonna talk about. I want you all to keep these people talking. We have, it's going to be up to us. We all have to become speech therapists. When they're down to two, three word sentences, I, I've seen them gone in six months sometimes. We have to have them. And I'm telling them, when I'm training these nursing homes, I'm telling the staff, you don't just go into Mr. Jones' room and do your work and get out of there. You walk in that room, you have a conversation with this man. Because what happens, where do you hurt? We have information. We have to get out of them as long as we can. We've got to keep them talking as long as we can on this. I want you to learn to use all types of communication. I know this other guy mentioned body language, but this is huge. Body language, verbal, nonverbal, touch, facial. First of all, with the touch, I tell the facilities, I go, you're going to learn who you can touch and who you can't, and it usually takes once. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Some of Mr. Jones, they like that little tap on the shoulder. Another one, you, why you, you put your hands on me, right? And sometimes one nurse will see them, he, she can touch Mr. Jones. The other nurse goes, well, she did it, I can do it. She puts his hand on this man, and now there's a problem, I mean, getting combative. So we just got to pay attention to that. And the facial part, this is for you. You've got to walk in there smiling. I know it's tough, but they will mimic off of us. If you go in there grumpy, your day is going to get worse. They will mimic us, man. I promise you that on it. You need to make a connection visually, verbally, physically, emotionally. Right? If you're trying to get something across them and you see it's not working, time out. The further you push, you see those gears are half turning, you're going to make it worse. You've got to take five, ten minutes and come back and try it again. Don't push it, man. It's verbal communication. Right? I'm a, my specialty is dementia communication. In this deal. So being in alliance, you go, Mr. Jones, if you go in the bathroom, please sit on the toilet, wash your hands and face so we can go to the dining room. You get it. That's gone. And no baby talk. But we've got to break it down simple. Mr. Jones, could you please go in the bathroom? Period. Mr. Jones, could you now sit on the toilet? Period. Right? We've just got to break it down simple. On it. Right? And you got to stay calm as you go through this stuff on it. The body language is so important to this on it, man. You know, hey, if you're standing up, if you guys would pay attention to your body language for half a day, 
you all realizing how intimidating people you are. <laughs> yeah, you're standing over Mr. Jones like this, you don't really care what he's talking about, right? If you got like this, you don't, <laughs> what are you doing? You're threatening me on it. Towering over people. This is too much. Mr. Jones is in a chair and you're sitting over like this. Doctors in a hospital bed. Just sitting over, standing over this man with a clipboard and they're scaring this man. There's ways we've got to do this on it. Right? You know how important body language is? As the guy said there, he said, you know, anybody speak Spanish? I could be in China and somebody asked me a question in Mandarin and I don't understand a word they said and I do this. They understand. I, and I didn't even say a word. Right? It's huge to these people. We've got to learn to use it. This is the winning trifecta of dementia communication. I want you to use verbal, body language, and I want you to bring in the third element, the visual clues. Mr. Jones, are these the glasses you're looking for? As I'm walking in, I'm bringing in that third element. Anything you've got available to add into that conversation, this is probably what's going to pull together. Mr. Jones, are these the brown glasses you're looking for? All right, you bring this in. Is this the right white coffee cup? Visual clues will work wonders for you guys as we bring this all through on it. Please use all three. And you've got to think improv. You know what improv comedy is, right? They're just going to hand you a skit. You have no idea what's coming. And then you have to act it out. It could be the same thing with caregiving. Here's Mr. Jones. He's in a facility. He's looking out that window and he goes, will you look at all those monkeys in that tree? And the caregiver is like, what do you think she's going to do? Half of them, they go and they close the curtains. Well, guess what? Those monkeys are starting to start becoming gorillas. This is what I would do. I would turn away from the window and go, Mr. Jones, yeah, I love the monkeys. When I go to the zoo, I see the monkeys. I like the bears, and I also like the giraffes, and I like the elephants. Now the monkeys are way over there. You have to bring them off subject because that out that window is going to get worse. I don't even have to go close those curtains. I just got to redirect the other way. You've got to be quick on your feet with these people sometimes on it. And all behaviors need to be considered as a communication. You've got a woman in a facility, she's crying for four days. You know what the facility's doing? Oh, poor Mrs. Jones, she must be depressed. The doctor does his weekly rounds. He comes over and he gives her a little pain medication, and she stops crying. That crying was communication. If I get something to tell you and I can't find the words, I'm going to find a way to get your, my point across. You're probably not going to like it. Something might even go flying across the room. But that is communication. And as humans, we're like, Gary's being a jerk. I'm being a jerk for a reason. We've got to put this stuff together a little bit as we go on it. Communication tips, we stay calm. We feed, or they will feed off your emotions. I promise you that, man, on it. We use short, simple sentences, slowly and clearly, and only in visual contact. It took me a long time to figure this out with my dad. I was making mistakes all the time. I'm like, Dad, I'm going out to do a load of laundry. I get all the way to the back door, and I'm like, what did I just do? I have to come all the way back and go, Dad, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to go outside and put a load in the wash. Because if I didn't come back and do it that way, within two minutes, he's going out the front door looking for me. And I'm the one that created that situation. All right, so we've got to be careful on this with visual stuff. And, I'm going to, and we need to sit at their eye level. On it. We have the conversation. We don't stand like this. We pull up a chair next to them, and we go eye to eye, and we have the conversation this way. Limit distraction. Mr. Jones, I'm going to turn down the television for a few minutes so we can have a conversation. We never argue. You're going to lose. We all know that, right? And we can't start finishing their sentences. This is how we get bad information. I'm not saying you can't give them a encouraging word, but if you start finishing complete sentences for them, they're just going to agree with you to get you out of their hair. And now you get bad. And if you're in a healthcare setting and you're getting bad information, this could be fatal as we go through this stuff on it. Speak only when visible, please, on it. Prosopagnosia. This is poor facial, or facial, poor facial recognition or facial blindness on it. I walk into my house, and there's my mom sitting in the big chair where she always sat. And I could see the minute I walk in, her eyes were turning, and she could not figure out who I was. I close that door. I go, hey, Mom, it's Gary. We're going to have a nice conversation today, man. We're going to be good all afternoon. My voice would put it all together for her. When I told you that the police, their uniforms mean nothing, this is what's happening. All right. We've got to be careful of this as we go. This is why it's so important every time you walk in, you see Mr. Jones, you introduce yourself. I tell the staff in these buildings, I don't care if you were in that room five minutes ago. You walk back in, you reintroduce yourself again. Because just say you just blew your breath on a mirror. How fast did that evaporate? That's how fast that last introduction could have gone out the window. And if you go, 
hey, Dad, you remember me? You know who I am? That is the worst way you can start a conversation with these people. I don't care if you've been married for 50 years. Hey, Saul, I'm Julie, man. I'm your wife. We're going to spend a nice afternoon together. All right? We do it right on this stuff, on it. And we need to know what name they respond to best. Right? Dick Daves, dealing it. I get my dad on the second floor of the VA hospital. I'm not signing him in for an appointment. Right? The reception goes, Gary, your dad's all the way over there with his walker by the top of the stairs. I turn around and I go, hey, Joe. She goes, you call your dad Joe? I'm like, yeah, because my dad thinks I'm dad. <laughs> it ain't going to do me any good to yell dad over there, man, right? Right? If Mr. Jones, you know, if he goes by Robert or Bob, we've got to know this stuff. My mother's name was Florida. It's spelled just like the state of Florida. She goes by Flossie or Flo. What do you think happens when they go in the hospital? What's on that white racer board? Whatever's on that wristband. My mother's like, oh, they got the state I live in <laughs> on the board. And we need to know history. If Mr. Jones was a lieutenant in the Navy and he starts getting a little combative, he's like, hey, straighten up, lieutenant. Like, oh, I'm in trouble again. But if you didn't have that information, you can't use it. So we need to ask questions as much as we can on this, on it. And the attention span. We're going to be best in the mornings, man, for these people. We don't make doctor appointments around 3 or 4 o'clock because of why? Sundowners. You're right. How many times you're at the doctor's office? It's an hour. They haven't even called your name yet. You got a 3 o'clock appointment. Now it's 4.30. You're walking in the doctor's office. Now you're driving home in the dark. Right? We do all this stuff in the morning as much as we can. All right? And in-time communication. This is very important. We don't tell, okay, put it this way. If I tell my dad on Friday that he's got a doctor's appointment on Monday, what do you think I just did? Yeah, I made a pretty lousy weekend for the both of us, trust me. This. All weekend's like, I'm not going, I'm not going, man. I'm like, you know, that's like, hey. All right, all right, so why, why wait that, why do that? You wait till Monday. Right? Sometimes or something like that, the doctors, that sticks, man. You know, you don't know what's going to stay and what's not. You, this man could be in the hospital, and they tell him on a Wednesday that he has to go down to radiology on Friday. They left that man a mess for three days sometimes. I might not know where he has to go, but he might think, I've got to be somewhere. I've got to be somewhere. Right? So you wait till Friday. In-time communication is very important on it. We use it as much as we can on it. And this is what I want you to do. We use the word we. We take the pronoun you, and we throw it out the window. We just had a major hurricane come through Florida last year. They were evacuating. Matter of fact, my new job now is to go around and train all the hurricane shelters. I start next month, man. I'm going all the way down the East Coast. I'm starting to train all the shelters down there. Because they got a Florida got a big lesson last year. It's dealing and on it. So here's the police. I go, if you go knocking on Mr. Jones' door and say, Mr. Jones, you need to evacuate. There's a storm coming. He's going to close that door and go back inside. But if you go, Mr. Jones, we have to evacuate. We have a storm coming. You just made it into a team. And you just might get a little cooperation out of this person, and you just might save their life. We don't use the pronoun you anymore. We make it everything has teamwork on it. So when confusion is high, we try to keep your voice tones low. Anybody watch the Big Bang Theory? That little girl Bernadette with that high, squeaky voice? This doesn't work well with Mr. Jones sometimes on it, right? I'm not saying we all got to talk like Batman, but we got to keep our tones down when you see all the confusion up high as we go through this on it. And you bring in the physical clues as much as you can on this. Never assume they understand you, the yes and no's, the nods of the head, right? Mr. Jones, you know, that yes could be to get you out of there and no. Mr. Jones, could you please tie your shoes for me? No. Well, maybe at that moment he doesn't know how to tie his shoes. And maybe you just ask him in front of five other people. And there's nobody sitting here that wouldn't say no before looking like a fool. It's just very easy to go and go about that on it. So we've got to be careful with this stuff. On it. If you get something very important and you think that they understood, please come back five, ten minutes later and do it one more time. Because sometimes that second time is what makes it stick. And you're going to see behaviors with these people. It's part of the diseases. Some of the reasons, T UTI is huge on my list. We know what changes the behaviors and all the stuff going on top of this stuff on it. Medications are something to get changed. Overstimulation. Loud and unfamiliar noises. All this stuff taken out of the routine can all cause behaviors as we go this on it. We need to assess the problem. Why is it a problem? Is it even a problem? Right? What is the behavior on this on it? Is it environmental? Right? Can we fix this somehow? You get Mr. Jones in this hospital over here, and they get this other man in extreme pain over here, and he's crying and moaning all night long. This is not going to work for this man. 
We've got to change the environment as much as we can as we go through this line. And who's around? You just might come in and you look like somebody that owes Mr. Jones $10 from 1960, and every time he sees her, he wants his money. And sometimes we can't fix this. And sometimes Mr. Jones has got a big wad of tens in his pocket because he's been using it on everybody. But sometimes there's stuff we work on. So I'm telling the staff, you got to talk with your team leaders. If this is the case, it's not fair to the employee. It's not fair to Mr. Jones. We fix this. We change things around. We fix environment if we can. Solutions. We focus on feelings and not facts. What do I mean? Here's Mr. Jones. I want the black one. I want the black one. I want the black one. What's the fact? It's in his hand. Right? Here's the line. If the facts don't matter to him or her, they should not matter to you. You go straight to the feeling. Oh, Mr. Jones, I'm going to do everything I can to get you the black one. Let me take that one. I'll see what I can do. You go down the hall, you come back with the exact same one 10 minutes later, and 80% of it's going to work. But if you start arguing, you already have it, you're going the wrong direction. If the facts don't matter to them, please, they shouldn't matter to you. Keep this stuff in mind on it. All right? And then we go to the freezer and we get what? Ice cream before medicine, please. On it. Possible reasons, fear, anxiety, pain, boredom, all this stuff can cause behavior situations on this. So I've got to keep this all in mind. On it, ways to respond, we listen to their frustrations. I don't care if you can't understand two syllables Mr. Jones is saying. All right? Please don't turn your back and walk away from this man. Because now you're really going to cause the None of us would like that. Right? I don't care if you don't understand one syllable. He's just mumbling. You've got to pull up that chair next to him and pretend you're hearing him out. The minute you turn your back, it's going to go. On it. Verbal abuse, I hate to say this, but you're going to have to get used to it a little bit. On it. Right? And the suspiciousness. They're going to accuse you of stealing. On it. But that's only a part of suspiciousness. Misinterpreting. Mr. Jones is in this hospital bed over here. That evil curtain is drawn. I call that for a reason. There's another man over here, Mr. Smith. The doctor comes in, he talks to Mr. Smith. He goes, you're all set up for surgery in the morning. We're going to come, we're going to prep you. You're going to be in surgery about three and a half hours. You, everything, and he walks out that door. Well, guess what? All night, on the other side of that curtain, Mr. Jones is like, holy smokes, I got surgery in the morning. Because nobody took two seconds to go around that curtain to explain to this man, when you wake up, Mr. Smith will probably be in surgery. He's going to be OK. We've got to do this stuff right. On it. And sexual behaviors is something we have to address. If you get that gut feeling that something's going on, please don't just put it aside. Because some of these people are being. Sometimes it is the Alzheimer's and dementia, but sometimes it's not. There was a documentary on public, uh, PBS on Frontline two, three years ago, Living and Dying in Assisted Living, it was called. There was a woman, late stages of Alzheimer's, telling everybody she was being sexually assaulted. Nobody believed her. She had Alzheimer's. She doesn't know what she's talking about. The woman crawls out the window, falls to her death, second floor. The dementia unit's always on the top floor in these buildings. On it. Then they found out everything she said was the truth. We've got to at least question this stuff and get involved in some of this stuff. On it. Who's got power of attorney? Right. Here's what I want you to do. Every time you write your name for them, put POA after your signature or write out power of attorney. Because I don't care what state you're in, the minute your loved one takes your last breath and your power of attorney, it stops right then and there. So let's just say you go into the doctor's office, right? You go in the doctor's office, go in there in the hospital. You go in the hospital, they don't make it, they die in the hospital, they didn't come out. Emergency room was crazy. You just wrote your name down, no POA after it. Who do you think they're going to come after with the co-pays and all that? But if you would have put POA after your signature, you're released. We've got to put a plan to protect everybody. The minute they take their last breath, you are no longer power of attorney. It stops right then and there. It doesn't matter, all 50 states in the United States on it. Right. So if you just you go in the hospital, you sign your name in for them, and they die in the hospital, and you just was crazy, you just put your name down, they're going to come after you. With the, you're going to have to go and try to prove your power of attorney and all that. But those three letters, POA, after your signature, would have saved you from all that hurt. So just religiously get in the habit of putting POA after your signature of your power of attorney. Anywhere you sign for them. You're signing your name with POA for them. Right. Or you can write out power of attorney. But they're not able to sign. If they're not able to sign. Right. That's why you're power of attorney for them at this point on it. 
if you've got a joint checking account with these people. Right? It needs to be an or and not an and. Remember in the old days, it used to have two names that say or and and between the two names? You notice that's gone <laughs> on the checks. It needs to be an or an account. You need to call the bank or walk into the bank and say, do I have right of a survivorship on a joint account on it? Trust me, my mother just passed away. I think Lucifer has his account at Bank of America. Every time I talk to somebody, I get it. and I was the beneficiary of the account. I could see them holding it for 60 days, then it was 120. I end up calling a meeting and go, I want to know which one of you people are lying to me. Because every time I talk to somebody, it's a completely different story. I had my money in two days. It was only $3,000. It wasn't even the money. It was the point of that, that they were not being honest with me, the owners. So you just got to be careful with this stuff on it. I want you to talk to an elder law attorney. There was a couple of guys here earlier today on it. What I want you to do, I want you to walk in there and say, I want you to make a plan for both of us, to protect both of us, the person with dementia, your loved one, and the caregiver. We're always forgetting about taking care of us. The financial stuff in the end could destroy us. You don't know what's going to come after you in the end on this. I know so many people that have trust built. They get everything in a living trust. They never deeded anything to the trust. That person dies out, he's empty, and that trust is empty. All right, so we've got to make sure it's done right. So the gentlemen who, who we had talked to, the other guys, make sure you got your stuff done correctly on this on it. So tap in and tap out, folks. I'm not a wrestling fan. i got two nephews that are fanatics. But when you double team in wrestling and you get yourself in trouble, you reach out, tap, and the next guy comes in. I'm hoping you have somebody to tap. You can't do this by yourself. Maybe at first, maybe halfway through it, but there's going to get a point where you're not going to be able to. So you, we need to get ready now for what's coming towards there on it. And if you think you're going to do it by yourself, your, your term doing this is going to get shorter. None of this is easy on it. I just went through 20 years of it. Trust me, none of this is easy. But you can do stuff to make it better. The first round with my dad, I made one mistake after another. Second round with mom, I handled it a lot better. I learned from my mistakes. So, all right. Let's get through this on it. I get an email that comes out, a newsletter once a week with my articles. I highly recommend, I got a clipboard before you leave, come up and sign it. Right? And I get some books for you for 15 bucks. This covers everything we talked about and then some. I'll be happy to sign them for you. And I don't want to go home with the, with the plane with a bunch of books. Because <laughs> my luggage ain't going to work all that way, man. So help me out a little bit on this. I can take credit cards and cash on it. Did we learn something today? Yeah. Thank you.